Well, ever since uh, the threat against me and the attempted setup of me uh, with the child pornography, I decided to take a proactive approach and go after the biggest uh, violator of uh, abusing children, and that was Eurus Deming. He's Eurus Deming. He's Eurus Deming. He's Eurus Deming. He's the former Ministry of Justice in Holland who has been caught many times. There's many witnesses. There's many victims. There's many. There's such a huge amount of evidence against him showing how this man is a child a pedophile, is a rapist of, of children. Uh, I'm going to start this story with a simple question. How come that a Dutch politician named Joris Deming, unknown to the American audience, has more power today than President Nixon had back in his days. You see, when President Nixon was tied in today, Watergate scandal, he was forced to resign. But here we have Mr. Deming. George Deming involved in a scandal far more worse than the Watergate scandal ever was but still holding on to his power until today it is unbelievable the story that I'm about to tell you is not a fictional story it is a story based on factuality it has nothing to do with conspiracy theory and I hope it will change your view of what Holland really is forever because you see some of my American friends told me that you know you live in a great country you know Holland is a small country but it has great and big liberties you know it's not freedom you see if this would be freedom if this country would be about democracy Mr. Deming could not be in office today he could not be in power today after the scandal that I called the Deming gate broke out you know he didn't resign he did not have to resign he has more power than President Nixon ever had think about that now I'm going to introduce you to a guy and it's the only guy it was a Dutch journalist you know who had the balls to confront Mr. Deming with the core of the scandal I'm going to show you the original footage of that historical moment and I'm going to translate what it is that is said there I'm not going to subtitle it I'm going to show you the footage and I'm going to tell you exactly what it is that this journalist states right so before we are going to watch that footage remember that the Watergate scandal when it broke out it involved all the president's men it was a huge scandal lots and lots of people were involved but when it broke out it forced Nixon to resign period and here we have this man this Mr. Deming this unknown Dutch politician this unknown man having more power than the entire Nixon machinery at the peak of its days keep that in mind now let's watch the footage Mr. Deming are you still abusing children? Are you a pedophile, Mr. Deming? When did you last abuse a child? Why don't you talk to me, Mr. Deming? We pay you with our tax money. Are you abusing children? Are you a pedophile, Mr. Deming? 
You are making more than 180,000 euros a year. What are you doing with this money? Pinocchio Bar, do you know a guy named Frank Landers? Mr. Deming? Did you ever visit the Pinocchio Bar? What did you do in Japan, Mr. Deming? What did you do in Japan? Now, who is this Mr. Deming? Mr. J. Deming was born on December the 11th, 1947. And he is the highest government official of the Department of Justice. Under his responsibility, we find the entire Dutch justice system, but also the Dutch Forensic Institute, for example, or the Immigration and Naturalization Services. He's also the national coordinator of counter-terrorism. Because of all this, Mr. Deming is the most powerful man of our country and there should be no question whatsoever about his integrity by law because of all these accusations our court system is about to collapse it's on the verge of breakdown it's about to be crushed under the weight of public opinion. Mr. Deming spends more than 18,000 euros each and every year on liquor and dinners. On top of that, the accusations in relation to pedophilia are so severe that, you know, it defies belief. Mr. Deming's private residence, Riaustra 13 in Den Haag, turned out to be a registered children's daycare center. We know this because of a publication of the local newspaper in Den Haag, the Posthorn. Because of the fact that in 2005 Dutch law dictated that children's daycare centers should be registered, this story also broke. Mr. Deming also turned out to be a wanted man in Turkey, where certain authorities claimed that he had abused Turkey's children during his many state visits. Let's listen to the testimony of some of his Turkish victims. So I ran away when I was 14, 15 years old and I came in Amsterdam at the central station and I was picked up by a man who gave me uh, food and a house to stay and I went with him because I didn't have another place to go. I was so naive, I believed I could find a job, I could find work, people to help me. They pick up uh, boys who are coming from abroad the big cities uh, they pick them up at the stations. Uh, there are, are guys who are very clever, who see he's coming, he has nothing to do. They, they, uh, they, ask, they speak to him and they say, do you, you're, uh, you're looking for a place to sleep. You can come with me, you can sleep. And then they give them uh, alcohol, they give them drugs. The day after I woke up, I found myself without clothes. And uh, he made some pictures of me. And... Uh, uh, I say, what are you going to do with the pictures? Yeah, I will send them to your parents if you don't want to work for us. And I say, what kind of work? He told me about uh, these brothels uh, where young boys work. And I say, I don't want to do it. And then uh, they forced me into this business. They cannot go back home. It, it, it's, it's impossible. 
Dus they have to stay uh, at that place by their skies. I couldn't leave. Uh, and the simple reason, they blackmailed me with these photos, with this kinder porn, this, this child pornography that I was used for. I was naive, I was scared. It can go on because it's very good organized. Uh, and there's always people who are running away from home and going to the big, big city. It's, it's, it's all around going on. In these brothels there worked young boys from 14 until 18. I worked with seven, eight boys uh, my age for 15 years. They were also involved in a network, that's for sure, an international network of pedophiles smuggling boys in from Poland, Germany, Czech Republic, uh, Austria, UK, to work in these brothels in, in the Netherlands and especially Amsterdam. And he was for four years uh, used as a young prostitute and still he is suffering a lot about what happened to him then and that's why he came to me to see if I could help him. I was too naive and too shy and afraid that something would happen if I went uh, away or ran away from this brothel. When I worked in the brothels, most of them were pedophiles who were looking for have sex with young boys. And he was sent to customers or the customers came to the brothel. He was sent to parties where children were really abused with real SM techniques, young kids. When I used to work in these bottles, it was very obvious to other people that I was a minor, younger than 18 years old. I looked 14, 15 years old. I really suffered and uh, sometimes had a hard time to survive uh, because you work and sleep on the same bed. Uh, they give them more drugs, uh, more alcohol, they make movies of them, and then it's the problem for the guys when they want to uh, run away, uh, to, be, to go back home. Uh, they cannot be back home before they can be blackmailed with their families. Yeah, I was actually three times filmed in a movie. Uh, two were made in uh, Amsterdam, and one is made in uh, the Eemhof in Zeewolde. And the movie was made also with 14, 15, 16 year old boys. The, they drogate them and, and after that they blackmail them and that is a, a, a psychology uh, slave. Uh, I also had uh, seen and meet people who made snuff movies. Snuff movie is a movie where uh, several boys or one boy uh, gets sexually abused and murdered at the end of the movie. Uh, they asked me to play in one of these movies for a lot of money and I refused because I knew from other boys that it uh, can be very bad for you because you don't survive it. The customers of those used brothels are not the normal uh, people you, you think about uh, walking in the night and uh, entering those brothels, but among them were high-level politicians, um, members of the prosecution office and high uh, politicians. So people with high status in, in Dutch society. I was in the festival bar working there uh, in my youth when I was 14, 15 years old. And uh, I met uh, people there who are, who are pedophiles. I had uh, contact with uh, Professor Van Roon when I was uh, 15 years old. He was a professor at the University of Amsterdam. And he was actually the center of this whole Rolodex investigation because <clears throat> he had all the numbers of high-level politicians, uh, uh, uh, uh, lawyers, juridical officials and so on. And he was actually the go-between, the mediator between the brothel and the high-level customers. When I met uh, Professor Varon at the Festival Bar in Amsterdam and uh, he introduced me to a man who was sitting in a car with a driver. In the car, I also introduced myself. He introduced himself as Joris. When 
When I first met Demink, he asked me for my age and I said to him, I was 15 years old. Joris Demink asked me to have anal sex and he really wanted to force me to do that. He was sent by Professor Van Roon to a car with a chauffeur and a man in it named Joris that this man, and uh, of which later said I recognize him as being Mr. Deming. Uh, well, the uh, private driver was driving. Uh, he wanted to have oral sex. Deming never came out of the car. He uh, always stayed in the car because he don't want to be seen in those places. He was a very high uh, level person. And that was the reason he didn't want to go into these bars where all these young uh, uh, boys worked and where all these pedophiles uh, uh, came together. The second time I was with Deming, it was also in his car. And then he wanted to drive to The Hague, to this house, to have anal sex with me. I was a key witness in a very quick, a very big investigation, and that's the first time I realized that that was Joris Demming. In Amsterdam, there was an investigation in to the brothels where a b was victim of, and it stopped at the moment that they reached at the suspect, Mr. Demming. Uh, I was contacted by two detectives of the Dutch government. Uh, who were busy with an investigation for uh, pedophiles in Holland. They heard about me and they found out that I knew a lot about the child prostitution and child pornography here in Amsterdam and around Amsterdam. I was with Van Roon in Poland where he had contacts. I refused a few times because I don't want to get any trouble or worse, a bullet in my head. When I was in the Hague bicycling to my uh, soccer team, people shot three times at me. That they never did something with his story, which he told open and honestly to the police, he was again traumatized, the second time traumatized and feeling powerless. Professor Varone was uh, a kind of broker. Uh, he had a Rolodex with several names in it. And, in the, and also in these names, there were high level people from the Netherlands. Also a close friend of him was Joris Demming. Varone supplied young boys to Demming and other people in the network of the Rolodex investigation. This story for me is a real credible story because it was confirmed by one of the policemen who was then functioning as a policeman in the team that did the Rolodex investigation. And this <coughs> policeman also told me, still anonymous because he's very scared, that he found out that two suspects of uh, uh, the, the customers who came to those brothels was one high-level uh, prosecutor and another one was at that time a high-level uh, uh, official of the Ministry of Justice who is now Secretary General of the Ministry of Justice, Mr. Deming. So this policeman could confirm me that they were suspects in that investigation. During my investigation, I met uh, uh, He told me uh, his, uh, his story and, uh, and, and I checked out uh, uh, his statement uh, to me. And I can say to you that it's, it's completely, uh, it's 100% the right state. Because I spoke to a lot of other people who, who uh, prove that his, his uh, story is the right story he told me. We have now one person who is identified by four or five people as abusing kids, that's Mr. Deming. And when I see myself filing a um, criminal charge against this high um, uh, uh, official in the Ministry of Justice, actually the highest one, Mr. Deming, I see that there is a complete denial of all the evidence I have by the prosecutors who I asked to prosecute this case.
İstanbul e, surlarında, İstanbul'da tamam. işte, e, araştırdık arkadaşlarla sokak var, çocukları. Var. Sokak sokak çocukları. Sokak. Onları araştırdık, oradan bulduk. Bulduğumuz da oldu yani, birkaç kişiler oldu. Hı hı. Bir kişi daha şey seçtik. Çocuk korkuyor muydu ve ne Tabii diyordu size? Korkuyordu ya, korkmaz mıydı? Korkardı. Ama biz kimseye bir şey söylemiyorduk Şimdi. yani. The Turkish police caught him around 94. It was on a pedophile uh, party going on in Bodrum, and uh, they caught him because one of the minors he abused uh, ran away crying. I did an investigation in Turkey. I spoke to three, to three guys. Uh, two of them, uh, I interviewed them on video and on tape, and, and they told me they uh, they were being raped by by the secretary of general. Bana ilk önce işte yanan boşalma var, elimin üstüne boşalma. All the all the evidence I put it over to the prosecutor in the Hague, but they didn't do anything about it. I showed him the photos. He took one photo out of the book. He screwed them. Uh, that was the picture of the secretary general of the Ministry of Justice in Holland. When he saw the picture, he was very angry. And he told me that was the person who raped him. My Turkish cases in which I represent two kids, in which we have an amazing quantity of, um, of evidence. We have a policeman who said that he brought the kids to this same person, Mr. Deming, at that time also high official Ministry of Justice. These boys can never be the same. It's terrible, terrible to see that, how they are, have to, to, to, to live their lives, uh, on, go on and go on. I think that my investigation is shut down because it's of the high level person uh, is so powerful they can, that he, he, he can break down my investigation. Those men, those high-level customers, they didn't get the boys only from foreign um, countries. They got the boys also from criminal organizations. So what we see also is that criminal organizations in the Netherlands get their influence on high-level officials in the Ministry of Justice who has the power to decide about everything. So this means that you get a complete deterioration of your system of democracy, rule of law. He controlled uh, about everything. He controlled the police and he controlled the just, uh, justice system. He controlled uh, everything. He's a pedophile and he used his power uh, to continue uh, all his pedophile actions. In the Netherlands, they want to go on believe in their own fairy tale. And they don't want to believe that they are ruled by people who do those horrible things to kids and that they are so corrupt. They want to believe in the fairy tale of the Netherlands. So I think the Dutch don't want to admit that this is happening in their own country. But not accepting it means they let it go on. That's the problem and that's where we stand for that we say no, we have to bring this out. We don't want that this goes on. This is not the country we want to live in. Citizen Holland uh, says it, it, it, it, it, it doesn't happen in Holland. It happens uh, maybe in, uh, in other countries far away, but it doesn't happen in, in Holland. They don't believe it, therefore they can continue, uh, it's my opinion. When he sees that the people who were abusing him when he was a young kid without any power will be brought to court, then he can find his own power back as now an adult. Psychologically for him it's very important that his truth is accepted and that the guilty persons are brought to, to court. Deming uh, will, when he retires, will probably leave the Netherlands and what you know, it is it will really be a shame for the Netherlands that such a man is leaving his position with a ribbon of the Queen and maybe some extra money and can leave to a country where he can go on uh, using, abusing minors and uh, not being brought to, 
court. And what we want is that even before he leaves, justice will be done. The facts I have would be enough for a conviction, I say, as a criminal lawyer. We have to do uh, good investigations with good guys and good prosecutors and all the dirty uh, people uh, out, of, out of the investigation. If I not have been a victim of child prostitution and child pornography, I would have had a normal life. I should have had a normal sexual life. I would have had a girlfriend, go to college. Grow up as a normal person. That they will put uh, pedophiles, child abusers, and people who are busy with making kinder porn, child pornography, that they will be convicted and that they will seriously look to victims of uh, these brutal people because you are uh, damaged for life. When I first became a father, I realized how sick people were at the time I was working in the brothels. How can you do that to a child? Because you really molest them for life. You break them for life. I will hope that people will stand up and uh, make a fist and uh, and say this is that we don't accept it anymore that it's that's it's enough A high-ranking Dutch official retiring this week is being honored for his work. But human rights advocates say the man who served as the country's Ministry of Security and Justice doesn't deserve praise. They say he deserves prison. John Jessup explains in tonight's Focus Report. Much like a courtroom, these witnesses presented their testimonies to a Capitol Hill audience. But the man they accuse has yet to stand trial. I was afraid to say no and I was very young and innocent. That is the voice of a grown man describing emotional scars from childhood. His identity is protected because he barely survived an assassination attempt. That attack followed his allegations against what's been called the Dutch super elite. At 14 years old, he left his family in Turkey to find work in Europe. Instead of a job, he found trouble and was blackmailed into working at an Amsterdam brothel. That's where he says he met this Dutchman, George Demink, a high-ranking government official. The second time that we met, he wanted me to go with him to his home in The Hague. He claims he was forced to have sex with Demink, who now heads the Dutch Ministry of Security and Justice, a position the victim's lawyer says keeps him from being prosecuted. We can have nice laws in the Netherlands, but what when high elite people uh, uh, abuse uh, uh, children and they are not prosecuted. Why do you have your laws? The Dutch government acknowledged investigating several complaints against Demink, both in the Netherlands and Turkey, dating back to the 1990s. And its official finding? The outcome of these investigations has always been that the rumors and allegations are utterly baseless. A representative from the Dutch embassy attended the congressional hearing and criticized the panel's findings. The Netherlands takes the fight against child sex trafficking very seriously. Congressman Chris Smith, a leading advocate for human rights, believes that statement can only be backed up by taking action. All of this evidence does not suggest that crimes have been committed. I would be shocked, frankly. News of this case has spread across the internet with websites like this, arrestdemic.com. Its organizers want to stop the Netherlands from honoring him when he retires as early as this week. Till now, the ministers of justice are protecting him. Van der Plaas continues to call for justice against Demink and wonders just how high the case may go. I think it could be that more people are maybe involved. As for her client, the trafficking survivor, he only makes one request in addition to justice. Please help protect my identity 
because I still fear for my life. John Jessup, CBN News, Washington. I want everyone to look at this address over here at 666 3rd Avenue. Look up there, 666 3rd Avenue. It fits. Take a look at that. 666 3rd Avenue houses the Dutch Embassy wow. and APG. Embassy. And APG is the finance company that keeps your Demix pension fund. Well, this is the APG, this is the fund. Uh, we're at the address of the fund that gives George Deming his pension. He is about to retire, and his pension comes from this organization. And what we'd like to see is what his accusations be brought to trial and his pension and fund frozen until that happens, in addition to him not being honored by the Queen, so that we can bring it to trial fully. There's video, there are uh, witnesses, there's investigators involved, and there are victims, but they have not brought it to trial. Pedophiles should not be honored by the Queen. Pedophiles should not be honored by the Queen. Stop sex slavery. Stop sex slavery. Stop sex trafficking. Stop sex trafficking. Stop sex slavery. Stop sex slavery. Demick must go. Demick must go. Demick must go. Demick must go. Investigate Demick. Investigate Demick. Arrest Demick. Arrest Demick. Arrest Demick. So the reason we want George Demick brought to justice for trial in Holland is so that people that are not free can be free. There are 25-year-old women and boys walking around that were in sex slavery and raped as children have grown up that have no identity. There's no medication that can give you a new identity. It causes psychoses and behavioral disorders. And that's why I'm here, taking me my whole life to be whole from this. George Demick, who is Justice of Minister in the Netherlands, needs to be indicted in Holland. He needs to not be allowed back into the United States where he has, where he can have boys in the back of his limousine as he's done in Turkey and other parts of the world. He should not be honored by the Queen on October 26th until and after he's brought to trial to see if even he is innocent. But there are young men that was just a briefing in Washington DC that came all the way over from the Netherlands that have accused him and said he raped me. He sodomized me. Yes, yes, we'll make a change. Make that make an example. Make Jarvis Demick an example. Arrest Demick, arrest Demick. Everybody arrest Demick, arrest Demick. Arrest Demick, arrest Demick, arrest Demick. And so I'm here today, as you asked, um, in New York City, provided by the Rebecca Project, to bring George Denmick, who's the Minister of Justice over the Netherlands, to uh, justice. There are grown men now who are in their early 20s that he raped and sodomized from Turkey and the Netherlands, and they finally came out. They finally spoke about what happened to them. No one ever tells that you're raped or sodomized, that you're a victim of sex slavery, unless it's discovered. And so the fact that they could come out, we need to give people a safe place to fall so that children feel safe in saying what has been done. In terms of Congress, we have talked to many members of Congress, both the House and Senate and Democrats and Republicans alike. The hearing that was just held was by the Helsinki Commission, which is uh, handles the security in uh, Europe. We have also met with the Dutch Embassy here in the United States. Uh, and at the Helsinki hearing on October 4th, the Department of State was invited to testify and they did not come. They did not testify about why they gave the Netherlands a number one rating in terms of their ability to prevent and to prosecute uh, sex trafficking. Why the Department of State gave the Netherlands a number one rating when these accusations have been out since 1995. Um, the question we should ask is, why hasn't anyone, if these, if these accusers are, are telling are telling lies or they're being untruthful, why hasn't anyone prosecute, prosecuted these accusers? Because they're accusing one of the highest ranking justice officials in the Netherlands. The highest, as a matter of fact, apart from the Minister of Justice. And there's complete silence. There's been no libel lawsuits, there have been no prosecutions of these folks who have gone on tape. And also, they have come to the United States. Congress has basically had a briefing on this issue and questioned them. 
um, Congress has verified the veracity of their claims. They are speaking the truth and the world knows it. This is no different from Jerry Sandowski. For, for over two decades, Jerry Sandowski escaped prosecution because he was in the power elite. Joris Demick is one of the most powerful men in the Netherlands. He has people's secrets. He has secrets with the Queen, with the Queen's family. He has secrets with other government officials, and they're all protecting him so that he does not release their information. He's a criminal. He's a plain criminal like any other pedophile, any other, any other man who rapes a child, and he should be brought to justice. Joris Demick should be investigated. Joris Demick should be prosecuted. Joris Demick should be arrested. And Joris Demick should be found guilty and thrown in jail. Министерство юстиции неожиданно напомнило о свободе слова. Как уверяет адвокат Адель Вандерплас, в Нидерландах у растлителей детей мощное лобби, и ниточки ведут на самый верх. Мой клиент был в детском борделе и обслуживал политиков и членов правительства. Один из полицейских, который расследовал это дело, рассказал, что он был одним из их свидетелей, а мистер Деминг, генсек Министерства юстиции, одним из подозреваемых. Но к тому моменту, когда было получено разрешение на прослушку телефонов и обыск, произошла утечка информации из Министерства юстиции. И все следы были заметены. Упоминаемый Йорис Деминг с почетом вышедший на пенсию генеральный секретарь Министерства юстиции Нидерландов. Он неоднократно обвинялся в растлении малолетних. Есть шесть заявлений в полицию. Одна из возможных жертв насилия – Мустафа. Его лицо скрыто. За то, что много говорит, Мустафе едва не отрезали язык. Он уверенно опознает Деминга как своего насильника. Вот он тут мир. Ik heb ook een vraag voor meneer Pechtold vandaag. Heeft u de Volkskrant al gelezen vandaag, meneer Pechtold? Meneer Pechtold? Hoort u mij? Heeft de Volkskrant gelezen vandaag? Meneer Pechtold? Ik wil het niet meer bespreken. Meneer Pechtold? Hallo? Heeft u het niet gezien in de Volkskrant vandaag van meneer Demming? Nou, ongelooflijk dit. Nou, blijkbaar wil meneer Pechtold niet met ons spreken. Heel erg jammer, want ze zijn ook heel vriendelijk. Maar het interesseert u niet, dus het is een demmig zaak. Secretaris-generaal van Justitie Chantal van Lis, omdat de kinderen misbruikt. En dat daarom mensen opgesloten worden levenslang in Nederland. Interesseert u niet? Nou, bedankt voor uw mening. Mag ik in het boek aanbieden? Dat gaat over het feit dat het is, uh, de heer Demming al heel erg de dag van misbruik van kinderen heeft. Ja, zeker. Ik heb, het, uh, ik heb er over gehoord, maar uh, hij heeft daar een helder uh, standpunt. Dat geeft helemaal niets, want in dit boek wordt 400 pagina's bewijs uh, en er zijn nu 4 hoofdstukken. Maar de ja. feiten zijn dat er niks staat op de programma's het boek over te Ja, zeker. Ik heb het, uh, laat u het uh, boek even. Ik heb de recensies gelezen. Nou, er zijn geen ik recensies geloof, van verschenen, uh, dus dat kan niet. Maar ik geloof. Ik geloof. Uh, ik geloof uh, ik geloof de ministers die daar, die daar voor staan. En, uh, wij gaan het op. Ministers ja? die staan voor een criminele pedofiel. Is dat, is dat Nederland van 2010? In ons land uh, geloof ik ministers uh, van justitie gelukkig van welke partij ze zo ook uh, zijn. Ook als ze liegen? Ja? Geloof ik ze ook? Ze liegen niet. Je hebben toch ook hier in Aangekomen? De minister liegt niet. Ik wil wat vragen over de heer Joris Demming, uw secretaris-generaal. Oh, ja. Mag ik er iets over vragen? Die wordt namelijk verdacht van het misbruik van kinderen al heel lang. En 1994 komt hij ervoor in politieonderzoeken. Weet u dat? Ik denk dat u eens moet ophouden met uh, dit soort uh, uh, vragen en suggesties uh, uh, de wereld in. Voor suggesties, er is een container aan bewijs tegen deze man. Er wordt binnenkort voor de derde keer aangifte gedaan. Absoluut niet, het is gewoon niet waar. Remember, remember the 5th of november. Ik heb het Openbaar Ministerie verzocht om door te gaan met onderzoek. En ook nu weer vind ik dat er maximale openheid van zaken moet komen. De beschuldigingen zijn te ernstig. Zelf acht ik de beschuldigingen van mijn cliënt te serieus, te waarheidsgetrouw. 
om nu op zo in korte termijn de zaak te sluiten. De topambtenaar heeft een schikking met de bladen getroffen, want hij wilde niet naar de rechter. In zo'n gevecht zou immers zijn hele verleden op straat komen te liggen. In de gesprekken met Panorama en Gaykrant, achter gesloten deuren afgelopen week, heeft hij toegegeven dat hij seks heeft gehad met jonge homo's. En dat hij niet altijd vroeg hoe oud ze waren. Geen onderwerp, vindt hij, om in de rechtszaal uit te vechten. Goedemorgen. Ja. Mag ik u een vraag stellen? Nee, op dit moment even niet. Nee. Onderzoek, jongens. Nee, nee, nee. We willen een proces zien, een eerlijk proces. Hier. Rudy. Kom maar spreken voor Vendetta. Kom maar zijn coma. Onderbreek je zin met een vette barretta. Wat zie ik nu? Ik zie een ziek individu. Jongens, de hele spruik. En ik zie politici die niks doen. Ik heb te veel. Kom met het lied op de beat. Ik heb tegen corruptie. De lied, de elite. Artikel 1. Iedereen is gelijk. Met mij op de mic maak ik je met de grond gelijk. Die volken met zelf op justitie. Ja, we blijven vechten tot je staat voor de rechter. Give me some. Meneer Balli, zou ik u nog een vraag mogen stellen? Uh, doe het maar even. Uh, ja. Kom maar even. Het gebeuren over Turkije met meneer Danny. Ik, ik, ik loop met u mee. Ik ga met u mee. Yes. Dus, uh, dat ga ik nu niet doen, hè? Oké, okay, zullen we dat volgende keer doen? En laat maar kijken wat de toekomst is. U maakt zich schuldig aan een onrechtmatige daden. Weet je het wel, meneer Balin? Als u niet ingrijpt, de weerzinwekkende kinderverkrachter. Danny, u grijpt niet in. Kunt u wat schoon geweten in de kerk zitten? Ja, is u geweten schoon, meneer Juf Balin? In de kennis van de, van, van de delicten gepleegd door Joris Demming? Heeft u schoon geweten? Heeft u nachtmerries? Of de heer Demming, wat hij doet met kleine kinderen? Dank je. Ja. Leticia, ken jij Joris Demming? Nou, ik ga nu even in de rest staan. Nou, maar als er dus en daar dat ga dat ik de man van justitie, een crimineel is, die kinderen misbruikt, wat vindt u daar nog van? U kent hem, u heeft onder hem gewerkt, mevrouw Kinders. Ja, ja, ja. Nou, ja. Wat het feest antwoord van u, meneer uh, Heer Valin. U bent toch katholiek? Wat zegt de Bijbel over kindermisbruik? Wat vindt u eigenlijk van de katholieke kerk, van de misbruiksschandalen? Hoi, Hans. Heeft u een tongetje verloren, meneer Heer Valin? Ik heb nog vragen over Turkije, meneer Heer Valin. <laughs> Rekent u maar dat deze beerpunt open gaat, meneer Valin? Gewoon een paasfeest. Meneer Donner, heeft u de eerste kindermisbruik van Joris Demming benoemd als SG op justitie? Wat vindt u daarvan? Dat hij kinderen misbruikt. Gaat u met schoon geweten in de kerk in? Als u weet dat u een kindermisbruik en de recidivering op de heeft benoemd als SG. Heeft u dat nog vragen? Zo kan je iedereen niet altijd spreken. De heer Joris Demming. Ja, die ken ik. Weet wat er speelt met de heer Demming met zijn kindermisbruik? Ik heb alle verhalen, alle verhalen daarvan ah, gezien. Ja. Gaat het met schoon geweten de kerk in? Ja, ik wel. Zullen we die start krijgen? Onderzoek Joris Deep in huis.nl. Er staat alle informatie op. Er is voor de vierde keer aangifte tegen hem gedaan. Bij het pakket, bij het landingpakket. Dat is de secretaris van de Justitie in Nederland. Een criminele pedofiel. Mensen die hier. Secretaris-generaal van Justitie, weet u wie dat is? Joris Demming, weliswaar VVD'er, maar ook kindermisbruiker. Weet u dat? Kunt u dat met uw normen en waarden overeenkomen dat een kindermisbruiker bij Justitie zit? Ik mag niet geloven. 
Ik heb gespeeld met Dat hij de zwaar verdacht wordt van kindermisbruik. Ik zou het echt niet weten. Maar dat in de krant gestaan. Dat is de hoofdstad van justitie. Zwaar ja? crimineel. Dat is crimineel. Er staat van alles in de kranten. En, uh, Moet het uitgezocht worden? Ik hoor het graag dat de cijfer Moet het uitgezocht ja. worden? Wilt u nog even niet op reageren? Wilt u niks zeggen erover? Hoi hey Mark, ik Hallo. heb vandaag het uh, boek bij me over de Denning Doofpot. Ja, maar ik ben echt met iets anders bezig. Ja? Sorry joh. Oké, okay. je kan hem gratis bestellen. Kabinet, uh... Oké. Okay. Maar ik mag jou dat boek aanbieden over Joris Demming. Dat ik over Joris Demming ben. Ik ben een vriend mee, heb je dat nooit gehad. Hé, ik ben helemaal Dat is denk ik een topambtenaar. SG van Justitie. Weet je wat er speelt met de heer Demming? Nee, nee, nee, nee. Nou, iedereen weet het hoor, maar ik wil die vragen. Maar wat vindt u ervan als de hoofd van Justitie crimineel is, die kinderen misbruikt? Wat is dan uw mening daarover? Ik weet het niet, daar weet ik niet. Is er niks van? Wilt u het graag weten? De Demming doofpot. Of de secretaris van Justitie, die een criminele pedofiel is. Mag ik het aanbieden? Nee, nee, nee. Ben je niet geïnteresseerd in het? Totaal niet. Totaal niet? Ik ben toch een christenpoliticus? Ja, dat is heel christelijk voor de democratie. Daar is dat. Nee, daar houdt u niet van. Daar houdt iemand niet van. Daar houdt niet van. Wil niet nadenken. Hey, wat is van de oorlog en Afghanistan voor het kapitalisme? Vele doden! Ja, nou, maakt dat niet uit. Dat is de, staats, de secretaris-generaal van het ministerie van Justitie. Dat klopt, ja. En die wordt al heel lang verdacht van kinderhandel en kindermisbruik. Volgens mij is daar onderzoek naar gedaan. Is daar onderzoek naar gedaan? Ja, ja. En de geluiden die uit Turkije komen, wat weten u daarvan? Daar weet ik niets van. Oké, okay, en nou, als er nou zou blijken dat er uh, meerdere aangiftes gedaan worden tegen meneer Demming? Ja. Uh, wat zou u dan vinden van zijn positie? Uh, een aangifte mag iedereen doen, er worden zelfs aangiftes tegen mij gedaan. Oké, okay, dus uh, u zegt eerst onderzoek en dan... Uh... Dat is in een rechtsstaat altijd heel belangrijk. Dat iedereen de kans krijgt om uh, zich te verdedigen als dat nodig is. Heeft meneer de Wit zijn toortje verloren? De lovebag? Hij laat zich gewoon bedriegen. Ik bel ik hem op, denk ik, met Joris Demming. Hij is een slaaf van Demming, die man. Ja? Door een criminele pedofiel, die is dan een volksvertegenwoordiger. Oh, Joris, de SP! Deze man maakt Nederland te schande. Hé, hey, doe ze de, de groeten hè, de pedofielen van de SP. De SP, samen pedofiel! Kent u die affaire? Oh, Kent u die affaire, Joris Demming? Nee. Hey, het is goed dat je uit de politiek bent weggegaan. Ja. Ja, dus, dat wil je gewoon niet uitzoeken. Nee, ga je lekker thuis. Nee, dag, jongens. Wil je lekker zeggen? Waarom is Christa van Pels nooit meer terug? Ga je nou weg of niet? Nee, ik blijf bij u staan. Hoe ja, gewoon? Waarom is Christa van Pels nooit meer terug? Ik loop hier privé en altijd. Opzodemieter. Wil je van mijn camera af? Opzodemieter. Wil je van mijn camera afblijven? Van JD TV. Wat is dat? Joris Demming TV. Ja. Ik weet niet of je daar wel eens van gehoord heeft. Wie ben jij? Hoe heet je? Ik heet Erik. En wat is je achternaam? Hoezo wilt u dat weten? Erik Jong. Ja, uh, draait hij al? Ja, hij draait al. Maar nee, nou, ik vind het fijn als je me vraagt dat je nog niet draait. Oké. Okay. En dat je pas gaat draaien nadat ik toestemming heb. Oké, okay, ik denk dat toen ik tekst En die toestemming krijg je niet. Oké. Okay. Nou, ik denk toen net over de kinderen in de derde wereld. En ik weet niet of je de affaire Demming kent. Ja. Zullen we eventjes. Uh, sorry. Pardon? Nee. Oké. Okay. Ik wens niet overvallen te worden door camera's en u doet het nu weer. Pardon, ja, u bent toch een beetje tijdsbeheer. Oké, ja. Oké, sorry. Hoi Femke. Hallo. Alles goed? Ja hoor. Mag ik je een vraagje stellen? Nee, dat weet je. Vorig jaar heb je al Ik heb een boek bij me. Maar we hebben hier te maken met het grootste schandaal uit de Nederlandse juridische geschiedenis. Dat zeg ik u. Wettig dag. Nou, er is heel veel uh, verhalen over door Demming. Er zijn vier onderzoeken geweest. Er is nooit wat uitgekomen. Nou, het is hier een boek uh, waarin oh, ja, het bewijs wordt. Maar waarom dat ze er niks van weten? Want nee, nee, nee. Er zijn vier aangiftes nee, gedaan. Dus is geen eng een aangifte. Dus vier geen... aangiftes. Aangiftes ken ik. Maar er is geen bewijs. Aangifte doen is geen bewijs. Maar hier dit boek staat 400 pagina's bewijs. Er zijn ook vier onderzoeken gedaan door de AIVD, de BVD en anderen. En er is niets uitgekomen. We kennen de verhalen, maar er komt steeds niets uit. Dus spaar mij uw bewijs. Joris Demming. <laughs> Wat kom ik daar nou bij? Ja, ik ben van je beter bij, dus ja. Ja. Daar hebben wij het over. Ja, kijk, ik kan wel alleen maar zo zeggen. Mijn wet en regels gelden voor iedereen. Dus, maar ja, dat schiet ook niet. Dat schiet ook niet op. Dus, uh, maar, uh, oké. Okay. De affaire Demming. Ja. Dat was van justitie, geloof ik. We hebben nu een nieuw boek hier. Oké. Okay. En dat zou je eventueel kunnen bestellen. Oké. Okay. De Demming Doofpot heet het. Ik knoop het in mijn oren. Ja. Goeiedag meneer Pasek, daar ben ik weer. Ja. Kijk eens aan, deze keer heb ik een bij me voor u. Hartstikke. Ik mag hem hebben? Ja, nee, ik ben geen... Ik moet snel weg? Ja, ik ben weer Oké, okay, tot ziens. Ja, ik lief ja. ook. Ja, Micha. Ja, Joris Demming. Joris Demming, ik heb jou een paar keer over gesproken. Ja, dat kan ik. Ik heb nog steeds het boek bij me. Ja, maar dat... dat uh... 
Ja, een andere keer doen. Nou, waarom? Maar waarom is hij zo bang als hij de Demming, de naam Demming valt? Dan heeft iedereen wat helemaal paranoia van Ik heb het zelf een licht, weet je. Maar dit is een heel bijzonder boek. De hoogste man van justitie, een criminele pedofiel, vier aangiftes tegen gedaan. Echt kindermisbruik, sadistische snuffmovies, marteling van kinderen. Meneer Plasterk, laat u dat onberoerd. Sorry? Laat u ook gewoon beboerd. Nee, nee, nee, Hoogste nee, man maar... justitie, crimineel, doet u niks. Iedereen een beetje lachen. <laughs> kinderen, kinderen gemarteld, kinderen vermoord, vier aangiftes. Op een ministerie, totaal corrupt. He? De hele Nederlandse strafrechtelijk beleid, één grote puinhoop, rechtelijke dwalingen, pseudo-justitie, onschuldige mensen in de cel, pedofielen aan de top, kindermisbruik, wordt allemaal getolereerd. Vee van de prima. Niks aan de hand. Moet het toch wel waar zijn, hè? Ik vind nou dat iedereen, omdat jij vindt shit in deze zaak, dat iedereen vindt shit staan in deze zaak? Nou, ik denk omdat meneer Demmink een bepaalde publieke functie vervult, dat hij wel meer onder de loep hoort te liggen dan, dan een gemiddeld persoon. Nou, succes voor mij, maar ik heb er gewoon geen zin in. Hey, Joost. Hey, ja, lang geleden. Meneer Dales. Hallo. Heel goed. Mika Kat, van Kokka Lanje DTV. Ik wil je vragen, je bent de partijgenoot van Joris Demming. Ja, dat weet ik. Weet u wat er speelt rond de heer Demming? Wat is nou, buiten van ernstige feiten? Joris Demming is een keur van meneer. Vindt u dat keurig meneer? Ook als er vier keer aangift is gedaan tegen het kindermisbruik? Ah ja, maar met de meneer Demming. Meneer Demming, misbruikt u nog steeds kinderen? Bent u een pedofiel, meneer Demming? Meneer Demming, meneer Demming, neemt u nog laatst een kind misbruikt? Waarom zegt u niks? U wordt betaald met gemeenschapsgeld. Meneer Demming? Misbruikt u kinderen, meneer Demming? Bent u een pedofiel? U verdient 180.000 per jaar, meneer Demming. Wat doet u met dat geld? Pinocchio Bar. Kent u Frank Leenders, meneer Demming? Kent u Frank Leenders? Meneer Demming? Gaat u naar de Pinocchio Bar, meneer Demming? Wanneer bent u voor het laatst geweest? Mag ik u een flyer van Joris Demming aanbieden? Nou, nee, dank u zeer. U gaat de samenwerking met Joris Demming uit. U gaat de samenwerking. Uitstekend, uitstekend. Maar weet u niet dat hij, dat hij crimineel is? Dat hij kinderen misbruikt? Nee. Weet u dat? Mag ik u dit aanbieden? Waarom neemt u dat niet aan? Neemt u dit toch aan, meneer? Dat niet. Ja. Maar meneer, meneer Opstelten, yes. bent u nog steeds voorzitter van de bestuurgroep aanpak kindermishandeling? Bent u dat? Waarom praat u niet? U kunt geen met mij praten, legt u geen verantwoording af. Meneer Opstelten, heeft u gefraudeerd als student met tentamens? Ik heb iemand die dat zegt, dat u als student gefraudeerd heeft met tentamens. Is dat zo? Klopt dat? Meneer Opstelten, waarom geeft u geen antwoord? Ik vraag het toch heel beleefd. Ik ben een journalist, meneer Opstelten, ik ben een journalist. Vier aangiftes tegen Joris Demming, uw secretaris-generaal. En u bent voorzitter van de stuurgroep aanpak kindermishandeling. Hoe kan dat nou dat deze man kinderen mishandelt en dat u voorzitter bent van de stuurgroep? Waarom hebben jullie weg? Nee, ik ben niet van de stuurgroep. Je begrijpt dat je een paar pieces of trash bent. We're not going quietly into the night. We're not backing off and we're not shutting up. Joris Demming, je bent een vieze vuile slang We blijven rellen, je gaat branden, wacht maar Het duurt niet meer lang, de stand van zaken Nederland wordt langzaam wakker, ze denken fuck het Maak die motherfuckers een met de vlakte The uh, commission will come to order, and I want to wish everybody a good afternoon. And welcome to our briefing on listening to victims of child sex trafficking. The sex trafficking and abuse of children is one of the most despicable, violent crimes on the face of the earth, shattering the lives of the victims as well as their families, a crime from which the victims often cannot recover. And when they do so, and that's rarely, they do so with great difficulty. The traffickers and abusers rely on their ability to frighten a child into silence or the reluctance of adults to listen when children speak. They also use their own reputation, standing in, or power in the community to prevent allegations from being properly considered and investigated. As we have seen recently in the tragic Sandusky case, child sex abuse case at Penn State, many sexually abused children do not find a way to speak until they are adults. But when they do so and are heard, others find the courage to come forward, putting the traffickers and the abusers behind bars and bringing an end to a cycle of broken lives. It is imperative that the justice system be ready to listen to allegations and to thoroughly investigate allegations no matter when they are raised and no matter who is accused. 
This year's trafficking in persons report, and I would note parenthetically that in 2000, I was the author, the prime author of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, as well as two subsequent reauthorizations of the TPVA. And one of the provisions of that legislation established the annual tip report and the ratings of countries, either tier one uh, to tier three. Well, the tip report noted that although the law in, for this year, although the law in the Netherlands prescribes maximum sentences ranging from eight to 18 years imprisonment for individuals convicted of human trafficking, and that these penalties are sufficiently stringent and commensurate with, with those prescribed for other serious crimes, such as rape, the laws are not being enforced. According to the report, and I quote, the average sentences imposed on convicted traffickers continued to be less than two years, 21 months to be exact. 21 months for destroying a woman's soul and body in the enslavement in the brothel. Nine convicted trafficking offenders received community service or a fine as punishment. The leader of a major Turkish German human trafficking organization was sentenced to seven years and nine months imprisonment for having forced at least 120 women into prostitution. That is just one month in jail for every life destroyed. And by the way, the court let him out on bail, and to no surprise, he fled to Turkey. So he is currently not even serving the tiny sentence he received. That leaves me speechless. What is going on here? Do the courts in the Netherlands take human trafficking seriously? This afternoon, we're going to consider how and to what extent allegations of trafficking and abuse should be investigated. We'll do so in the context of a particular series of cases in which very, very serious allegations have been raised against the Secretary General at the Ministry of Justice in the Netherlands, Mr. Joris Demek. Mr. Demek has been accused by a witness that will present today of sexually abusing and raping the witness when the witness was being trafficked in a brothel in Amsterdam at the age of 15. The investigation into these accusations was suddenly and inexplicably halted, and law enforcement officials involved were allegedly sworn to secrecy. Mr. Demek has been accused by two Turkish boys, now adults, of having raped them in Turkey between 1994 and the year 2003. At the time, the boys were 11 and 14. At least one of them was homeless and trusted the Turkish police officer who brought him to Mr. Demek. The other was allegedly locked in a hotel room with Mr. Demek, who assaulted him sexually. The allegations are shocking and horrible. Mr. Demek has a right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. And that is a sacred right that I'm sure we all want to protect. At the same time, the allegations, when taken in their full context, are credible and deserve to be properly investigated so that a prosecutor can make a responsible decision whether to proceed with the case against Mr. Demek. That investigation has never happened. The investigations that have taken place have been a travesty and have done nothing to clear Mr. Demek's name. Rather, they have raised further questions. Yesterday, the Net Netherlands Minister of Security and Justice, Mr. Opstelsten, wrote to the Dutch Parliament regarding this case and listing the actions taken by the Justice Department in regards to the allegations against Mr. Demek. The letter states, and I quote, the nature of Mr. Demek's job warrants a degree of vigilance, quote unquote. I could not agree more. The fact that Mr. Demek is the Secretary General of the Ministry of Justice the very entity responsible to investigate the charges against him should mean that the investigation into the allegations was one of the most thorough, transparent, and well-documented investigations ever undertaken by the Netherlands. Not only are those making the allegations literally taking on the Dutch justice system in person, in the person of the one of its top officials, but the reputation of the Ministry of Justice itself is on the line. Sadly, the investigation was anything but thorough, transparent, or well-documented. The very serious allegations were never given the courtesy of a criminal investigation, apparently because Mr. Demek's claims, and the Dutch cannot disprove with their own records, 
that Mr. Demek was in Turkey in the 1990s. Over and over again, the Justice Minister's letter to the Dutch Parliament states that there was no cause to launch a criminal investigation. With all due respect to the Justice, Dutch Justice Minister, this is a tacit admission that a thorough investigation has never been undertaken. It makes the justice, Dutch Justice Ministry look a little bit like an ostrich with its head in the sand. The Dutch government freely admits that it never so much as interviewed one of the two alleged victims pressing charges, Mustafa and a third victim who has now come forward, Yassin, who has never been interviewed, has also never been interviewed. Moreover, the Dutch investigation into whether there should be a real criminal investigation never interviewed the Turkish policeman, Mehmet Kurtzmans, who admits that in the 1990s he abducted boys for Mr. Demek to sexually assault. Nor did the Dutch investigation speak to the former chief of police of Istanbul, Nestet Menzer, who also contradicts Mr. Demek's Mr. Demek and states that Mr. Demek was in Turkey in the 1990s and that his officers were assigned to protect him. Nor did the Dutch investigation into whether there should be a criminal investigation speak to uh, Hussein uh, Celebi, the senior Turkish intelligence officer who in 2006 wrote a report on Mr. Demek's travel to and nefarious activities in Turkey during the 1990s and early 2000s. And who also says that Mr. Demek used aliases to enter and to exit Turkey. I live a long way and work a long way from the Netherlands and do not claim expertise in the details of the Dutch justice system. But frankly, from my vantage point, I have to ask, how can a preliminary investigation not interview the victims or key witnesses and then claim <clears throat> there is nothing to investigate? Whether or not Mr. Demek is guilty of these allegations against him, we cannot say. But I will state my strong belief that the allegations against him will not be resolved without an actual and thorough criminal investigation into the allegations raised by the victims and supported by the Turkish government officials. The Netherlands owes this to the boys who have been grievously harmed by Mr. Demek. And the Netherlands owes this to Mr. Demek himself, whose name has been dogged by abruptly and by abruptly halted and grossly incomplete investigations for over a decade. Mr. Demek himself, who maintains his innocence, if he is innocent, should want this investigation to go forward so he can clear his name. So I appeal to him to state publicly his own request that an investigation uh, be conducted. I'd like to now uh, introduce our very distinguished witnesses um, for today's briefing and, uh, and then ask them to proceed. We'll begin in order uh, with uh, BVW, who was a victim of child sex trafficking, child pornography, and pedophiles. He, he identified uh, Joris Demek as a man who abused him as a child and was a primary witness giving a detail of a pedophilia ring in the Rolodex affair. This was the leading investigation into a pedophile network of the highest ranking politicians, civil servants, and influential government and business officials in the Netherlands, which included uh, Joris Demek, now the Secretary General of the Dutch Ministry of Justice. His face must remain hidden due to the highly provocative and damaging information he is privy to and regarding the significant power brokers in the Netherlands and because of threats. We will then hear from Ms. Adele van der Plaas, who has spent the last three decades as a criminal attorney in the Netherlands. Prior to that, she taught criminal law uh, at the University of Utrecht. Adele was a member of the supervisory board of the Bar Association of Amsterdam, and as a, in a pro bono capacity, she has worked tirelessly through the years, fighting injustices and judicial bias against abuse against the system. Adele is a tireless advocate for children and brings invaluable awareness to sex trafficking in Holland which, according to the United Nations, is one of the top 10 destinations for human trafficking. We will then hear from uh, Klaus Langen Duin, who is the chief of criminal intelligence, former chief of the Criminal Intelligence Services 
for the Netherlands. Uh, today, Klaus is a private practice uh, and works in private practice as an independent investigator. In this capacity as chief, he served as the lead investigator in the RT mission. We have combated drug trafficking and illegal drugs smuggled into uh, the Netherlands. And then finally, uh, we will hear from uh, Samantha Healy uh, Vardaman, uh, who is the lead on policy issues for Shared Hope International, coordinating advocacy efforts to further the protection of sex trafficking victims. And I would note parenthetically with whom this commission and me personally with my subcommittee on uh, human rights and the foreign affairs committee, which I also uh, chair, uh, have worked on legislation over the years to ensure uh, that we have the tools in the United States in our laws to combat this heinous tra uh, tra trafficking in persons. Uh, so I am very, very grateful uh, for her work and for the leadership that she has shown all these years. After directing a rule of law program in Moldova for three years in which human trafficking issues frequently figured prominently, uh, Samantha joined Shared Hope International in July of 2005 to direct the Trafficking Markets Project, resulting in a research report and documentary t entitled Demand, which compares sex trafficking markets in four countries, Jamaica, Japan, the Netherlands, and the United States. In 2006, she began directing a three-year research project in 10 U.S. locations into the sex trafficking of American and lawful permanent residents minors in the United States, funded by the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs, and the Bureau uh, of Justice Assistance. I would just point out that we in the United States take a backseat to no one, and while we look at other countries, we look at ourselves. And this year's TIP report, as in some previous ones, likewise rates the United States, just as it does other countries, against the backdrop of what we call minimum standards, first developed in 2000, and then continuously updated over the years. Uh, we want all victims protected, whether it be in the United States, the Netherlands, or anywhere else in the world. Uh, we are joined by uh, Ranking Member Cohen, uh, who, uh, sorry to put you right on the spot if you want to come back, for any comments you might have uh, before going to our first uh, uh, witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your calling this meeting on this topic that's so, so, so important. Um, the idea of trafficking of children has been going on for a while, but has come to the public's attention most recently in a glaring manner. I think the world is more aware of it than ever. And we need to do all we can in the United States and with throughout the OSCE and the world to end it. The idea of somebody's liberty being taken from them is the most heinous thing that I think one can have happened to them. Uh, and for children to be taken from their parents uh, and to be used as a commodity is so immoral that the world's attention should and has come upon it, but the world's resources should also come upon it, and we should commit ourselves to doing all we can to rid ourselves of this decay that is within our world society. And I'm appreciative of the chairman for scheduling this important hearing and looking forward to the testimony of the witnesses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole. I'd like to now, Mr. B, if you could proceed. Thank you very much. At the age of 14, I ran away from home. Due to trauma of my parents divorcing and the misery that I had encountered at school and at home. I took the train with the destination Amsterdam, thinking that I would find a job and create a life. Upon arrival at the central station, I was approached by a man who offered me a place to stay. The following morning, I awoke without any clothes and they were taking naked photos of me. I asked him what he was going to do with those photos. He said that he would send them to my parents if I didn't want to do what he wanted. He told me about the brothels where young boys worked. I was then brought the same day to a bar and was introduced to a man who had a brothel for young boys. I was afraid to say no and I was very young and innocent. The owner of the brothel forced me to work in this boys brothel where more young minors worked. 
They were all under age minors between the age of 14 until 18, from various parts of Europe. All of the clients that came to this brothel were pedophiles. All the boys working, they were given drugs and alcohol. After a while, this was the daily routine of the sex, drugs and alcohol. In addition, we are rented out for escort services to private clients and parties. The same person who ran the brother, who ran the brothel also made child pornography films. I performed in three of those movies. I also knew people who made snuff movies. I was offered vast sums of money to perform. Yeah. Uh, I was offered vast sums of money to perform in one of these movies, but refused, due to the fact that at the end of, the, of these movies the actor is killed. As escort, I worked for the same brothel owner and worked out of a bar called the Festival Bar, where I met Professor Van Roon. Professor Van Roon was the man who introduced me to Joris Deming. We were sitting at the table and he said that I needed to go outside to meet Joris Deming in his car. Joris wanted to have anal sex with me and I refused. I did have oral sex with him. The second time that we met, he wanted me to go with him to his home in The Hague, Riaustraat 13. I didn't want to go with him as we were forbidden to leave the city of Amsterdam by our pimp. In 1998, there was a large investigation into a pedophile network in Amsterdam and The Hague. I was approached by several police investigation units to help with the investigation. I became the key witness of the, event of the investigation and was offered police protection. During that time, I told of my entire period in Amsterdam in the child pornography and the child sex business. This investigation was called the Rolodex investigation and Professor Van Roon was a key suspect in this investigation. He had a Rolodex, kind of a card file, where various high-ranking Dutch officials were his clients and friends. I accompanied Professor Van Roon on trips to Poland, but I don't know what he was doing there. Perhaps he was looking for boys for his clients. He was a broker and children for pedophiles in his network. After my, peri after my period in Amsterdam, I lived in various places in the Netherlands. I also lived in The Hague, where an attempt to kill me was made. I was shot at three times. After that, I went underground and tried to hide, as the Rolodex investigation was killed and never pursued. In addition, I was asked to cooperate in a Dutch TV news show investigating Deming and high-ranking pedophiles. That show was never aired. Throughout my time in the child sex industry and after, I have been abused, rejected, raped, shot at, lied and treated as dirt. My life has been ruined. I have to undergo long-term physical psychology treatment including very strong anti-depression medication. My relation with my own three, three children and wife has suffered intensely. I would like to ask the following. Help bring Deming to justice and his entire network of influential pedophiles. Those who abused me and many others like myself should be brought to court and punished if found guilty. Bring back the rule of law in the Netherlands. Please help protect my identity because I still fear for my life. I know too much about who are the pedophiles. Thank you for your time. Mr. B, thank you so very much for your extraordinary courage to come here today and thank the pain you. and the agony which I can see on your face and hear in your voice. I can't say enough how we wish you well and your calls, my hope, will not go unheeded. Um, and we will do everything we can as a commission because if we do nothing else as a commission, it's all about protecting the victims. And, and so, again, I want to thank you for your extraordinary courage for being here this afternoon. Thank you.
like to now ask uh, Ms. Vanderblas if you would proceed. Can you hear me now? Better? Yeah? Yes. A little closer, okay. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank your commission for the invitation to inform you about four child abuse cases we are working on for so many years already. I myself, I myself represent two Turkish witnesses who raped and uh, who were raped and sexually abused uh, when they were 11 and 14 years old. The perpetrator was, according to my sources, a high-ranking Dutch government official nowadays, Secretary General of the Minister Ministry of Security and Just Justice in the Netherlands, Mr. Joris Deming. I also represent B, who is present today and already uh, uh, was uh, uh, giving a testimony to you. B was a victim of the same Dutch high-ranking official, Mr. Deming, at a time that he, as a young boy of 14 years old, was forced to work in the brothel. I was informed about the crimes committed by Mr. Deming in Turkey by official Turkish sources. They informed me that Mr. Deming in 95 was caught in the act of sex with minors in Turkey while attending a party in Bodrum. At this party, minors were abused, sexually abused, and one of the boys tried to escape and created a great deal of emotion which brought the police. Mr. Deming was then arrested, according to my sources, and subsequently released, after which his criminal file was used in, uh, to blackmail the Dutch authorities to take action in a case against a Kurdish activist who at that time stayed in the Netherlands. I'm also the attorney of this Kurdish businessman named Mr. Radisin. The two well-documented criminal charges that were filed against Mr. Deming by the two Turkish boys, Osman and Mustafa, were never investigated according to Dutch criminal investigative procedure. The same goes for the criminal charges filed by my other client, Mr. Bidesin, against Mr. Deming. The victim who's present today, B, was in 98 key witness in the so-called Rolodex investigation, but neither his statement ever led to an investigation. never led to an investigation or prosecution or conviction of the real per perpetrators, the high-ranking customers, the Dutch super elite of the numerous minor brothels in our capital, Amsterdam, at the time. The question arises, Mr. Chairman, what is going on in the Netherlands? In your 2012 report on human trafficking, you recognize the Netherlands as a tier one status country in full compliance with the minimum standards to combat trafficking in persons. And my experience in the four cases I represent is completely different. High ranking government officials and politicians in the Netherlands seem to form a privileged elite who are above the law when they sexually abuse minors and will never be arrested, tried or convicted. In 2000, The Guardian, 12 years ago, described in a very well-informed article the Netherlands, and especially Amsterdam, as a paradise for pedophiles where the police seemed to be powerless to act. And we now understand why. In 98, an Amsterdam police investigation, B spoke about it, called the Rolf Dax Affair, was conducted into a pedophile pedophile network of influential Dutch customers of boys' brothels. The investigation targeted high-ranking Dutch officials and politicians suspected of abusing young boys in Amsterdam brothels. As a victim, B was one, what he said, of the key witnesses in that investigation. One of the suspects in that investigation was Mr. Deming, but according to leading investigators who told me that. Leading investigators in this case, according to them, as soon as Deming became a person of interest in this matter, the investigation was shut down. Information about intended actions by the investigating police was leaked. A policeman who worked on this investigation said that he arrived at the location 
and the middleman of this network, Professor Van Roon, was waiting for the police team. And not surprisingly, all video evidence was missing and all telephone communication between the suspects, which was recorded before, suddenly stopped. Law enforcement officials on the case were forced to sign non-disclosure agreements and were sworn to secrecy regarding all information pertaining to the involvement of Deming and other high-ranking officials in this shocking behavior. Our present State Secretary of Justice, Fred Taven, directly under the Minister of Justice, was one of the leading prosecutors in this Rolodex investigation. In 2007, he expressed his frustration about the blocking of the investigation in a closed court hearing under oath. He then told the court that this investigation indeed targeted high-ranking representatives of the Dutch government, among them prosecutors, who were sexually abusing minors. He also stated under oath to the court that this investigation never has led to prosecution of these suspects because of certain contra-actions. 2007, he stated that under oath. And when a Dutch publication in the Gay Krant accused Mr. Deming in 2003 of being involved in the abuse of minor boys in a park in the south of Netherlands, the newspaper, the Gay Krant, for homophile people, the newspaper was forced to withdraw its accusations under threat of bankruptcy by Deming's lawyer. The editor of the Gay Krant, Henk Kroll, at the moment parliament member in the Netherlands, was told by Deming in a private meeting direct after, directly after that he, Deming, indeed has had sex with young boys without asking their age. But Deming let Kroll know during that same meeting, remember well, Mr. Kroll, that we are the ones who make the laws in this country. In 2008 and 2010, I filed three well-documented criminal charges against Mr. Deming on behalf of my Turkish clients, Osman and Mustafa, for rape and a sexual abuse of minors under the age of 16. The criminal charges filed by Mustafa against Deming were never really investigated. The Dutch authorities dismissed the allegations after demanding that Mustafa first had to travel to the Netherlands to officially answer their questions. But meanwhile, the boy was heavily threatened and abused in Turkey. His tongue was cut with a razor blade. You have to shut your mouth in an effort to quash his complaint. The boy was approached by the then high-ranking police chief, Emin Arslan, in Turkey, who offered him a good life in case he withdrew his charges against Deming. If not, the boy's life would be destroyed, so they told him. The boy was frightened to death, but never withdrew his charges against Deming. He had his experience in Turkey where you don't have any right in front of such high-ranking officials. And as a result of what happened to Mustafa, I asked the Dutch prosecutor to arrange official security for Mustafa during his stay in the Netherlands to give his statement. I also asked the Dutch prosecutor to allow his lawyer to be present during the police interview. And these requests were consequently refused despite the terrifying experiences Mustafa went through. Mustafa did not travel to Holland to answer questions about his accusations against Deming as a result of this, but he offered again and again to answer all questions the Dutch police and prosecutors still might have in Turkey in an official inquiry hearing, but such an inquiry has never occurred. The second Turkish boy, Osman, traveled to the Netherlands, where he was also a client of mine, where he was interrogated by Dutch investigators in February 2011. However, a thorough criminal investigation was never initiated in this case either. Five witnesses, and Mr. Chairman President spoke about it already, with direct knowledge about this crime were waiting in Turkey to be interviewed by Dutch prosecutors but they were ignored until now.
The Turkish policeman Mehmet Korkmaz, who was Deming's security officer during the Secretary General's visit to Turkey and who had since uh, admitted kidnapping minor boys for Deming to abuse. Offered, he offered to be heard by Dutch police in Turkey despite risk of his personal safety. No one from the Nef Netherlands ever contacted him. His testimony can be seen on the video on our website and I thought it will be presented here too for some fragments out of it. And the same goes for the former chief of the Istanbul police, Nekdet Menzir. He also was willing to testify about Deming's visits to Turkey in the 90s and the fact that his police officers were ordered to protect Deming. No one ever contacted him either. Subsequently, also the offer of a third Turkish boy, Yasin, who said to have been sexually abused by Deming in this Bodrum event in 95, also he was ignored, ignored by the Dutch authorities. <coughs> Despite this overwhelming amount of available primary witnesses, the criminal charges filed by Osman and Mustafa never led to an official criminal investigation as defined in the Dutch Code of Criminal Procedure. The prosecutors persisted that there was not enough ground to call Mr. Deming a suspect and to start an official criminal investigation against him. Only a so-called exploratory investigation was conducted and that's not even existing in Dutch Code of Criminal Procedure. And without an official criminal investigation based on the Dutch Code of Pre Criminal Procedure, the hands of the prosecutors were completely tied, according to their own words to Mr. Langedon and me in a meeting. Without an official suspect and an official criminal investigation, the prosecutors lacked the authority to travel to Turkey to interrogate the available witnesses and to properly investigate the data of Deming's official and non-official trips in, 90, in the 90s. And in the Netherlands, where it only takes an anonymous tip to initiate not only a criminal investigation, but also police actions such as arrest and house search, the reaction of the prosecutor on this matter can be called quite absurd. Instead of performing its own research, the prosecutor's office has simply taken for granted Deming's alibi that he never visited Turkey since 87. A Dutch research journalist, however, who asked the Ministry of Security and Justice to be provided with all the travel dates of their high-ranking officials in the 90s, him was told that all travel documentation older than five years was destroyed, that was in February 2012. That's why the final conclusion of the prosecutor in Osman's case in February 2012 was that it could not be confirmed that Deming traveled to Turkey in the 90s. That's why they refused further investigation. Moreover, Turkish authorities have leaked documents proving that notwithstanding his denials, Joris Deming did indeed enter Turkey in the 90s. At the time, Mr. Deming was Director General of International Affairs of the Dutch Ministry of Justice, and as a member of the European Union K4 Committee, he was especially responsible for the Kurdish-Turkish conflict. Even without the Turkish doc document, documents we received, it's unconceivable for the Dutch to claim that a high-ranking European official with duties specially focused on Turkish conflict with the Kurds would not have visited Turkey during the 90s. That would be equivalent to an American ambassador of Turkey based in Washington who never visited Turkey. Besides that, it's a fact that the Dutch authorities who received copy of the Turkish list of travel dates of Mr. Deming never did any effort to check the status of this document in Turkey itself or to entry dates it mentions. The travel dates of Joris Deming are stored in the computers of the intelligence agencies in Turkey. Several sources confirmed that they have seen this information available to me. The latest information confirming Deming's travel dates we received from the Turkish prosecution office in Diyarbakir, in Kurdish region. This office has started now an investigation against Deming 
and two of his Turkish allies in corruption and child abuse, the former Minister of Interior, Mehmet Agar, and the former police and intelligence chief, Amin Aslan, who was the one threatening Mustafa after he filed his first criminal charge. One of the first results of the recent Turkish criminal investigation is that Deming used three different aliases to enter Turkey at the time. The validity of Deming's travel dates to Turkey are also confirmed by sources, including the ACK report of a senior Turkish intelligence official, Hussein Celebi. I give your commission this report. Celebi introduces himself in his letter of February 2010 as the Turkish intelligence official who wrote the ACK report in 2006 to inform the highest military, political, and juridical level officials in Turkey. In, this, in his report, he was the first to reveal what Deming did travel to Turkey during the mid-90s and how these criminal acts were used to blackmail the Netherlands in order to force the prosecution and conviction of the Kurdish activist Baybasin for non-existent crimes with the help of falsified telephone recordings. In his act report, Celebi wrote literally Deming also participated in similar pedophile parties, pedophile parties in Turkey. Because a gun went off during a party in Bodrum in 95, the police arrived. Joris Deming, who was especially occupied with the case against Bybasin in the Netherlands, visited Turkey, he says, as a tourist in 95 and for an international meeting in Antalya in June 96. And besides that, he writes literally, he entered and left Turkey in the years 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, and in most of the cases he wiped his tracks. This information is collected by official and special intelligence service, Mr. Celebi writes. It's also known, he says, that he entered Turkey under different names. The Dutch prosecution office, Mr. Chairman, never investigated the sources of the act report either. This is surprising because the information of the ACT report is confirmed in an old document of the Ministry of Justice in the Netherlands itself, in which is said that, and that was a document of 97, in that document is said that the Bybesin case is used as leverage in order to get something done from the Turkish authorities in another case. It's very clear. And it said that a responsible official in this case was Joris Deming, 97. The first reaction of the public prosecutor on the ACT report was towards me that in his view, and I have everything recorded on, on correspondence, his first reaction was that in his view, Hussein Celebi, the intelligence officer, was a non-existent person. Hussein Celebi then wrote his letter of February 2010 together with a photo of him in the company of a high-ranking Turkish politician, pol politician of the ruling Turkish AK party to the Dutch authorities, offering them, Celebi, to answer their questions regarding his report and accusations. Also, this offer was subsequently ignored by the Public Prosecution Office. All these facts lead to only one conclusion. The criminal charges filed by the two Kur Turkish boys, Mustafa and Osman, against Deming were never investigated. The travel movements of Deming in the 90s were never examined. None of the witnesses presented in Turkey were heard. During the orienting investigation, Deming simply maintained his position as highest ranking official of the Ministry of Security and Justice in the Netherlands. And on the base of this non-existent criminal investigation, <coughs> the Turkish criminal charges against Deming were dismissed by the Dutch prosecutor. It seems to be a complete repetition of what happened in the Rolodex investigation in 98. At the moment, I'm preparing an appeal against the decision of the Dutch National Prosecution Office not to prosecute Deming for the crimes committed in Turkey and the Netherlands against my clients Mustafa Asman, Osman and Baybesin. I'm still waiting for a promised copy of the official file of the Turkish prosecutor who collected the entry dates of Deming from the different authorities in Turkey in the 90s 
and the aliases he used when he entered Turkey, Deming. But according to my Turkish sources, there is a considerable pressure exerted on the Turks by the Dutch not to reveal the truth. One important issue to keep in mind is that the media have not been very supporting in informing the Dutch public about this horrific, horrific story. Most of the large mainstream media have not written anything for several years about Deming. This weekend, probably a large national newspaper is finally going to publish new material about Deming and other victims. The power elite in the government, we are told, have, has muscled the leading editors not to write about this story. I am born and educated in the Netherlands. I'm proud of the values of democracy and rule of law that govern in our society. I'm here because some of our leading officials seem to have hijacked our system, abusing all their <coughs> official power to cover up their ugly behavior towards young people and others. And that's terrifying. Nobody should be above the law when he sexually abuses minors or abuses his official government position to cover this up. We only search for justice, that people come in court, and we ask your commission help and advice to reach this. In conclusion, I would like to ask you for two things. The State Department should remove the tier one status from the Netherlands as they don't deserve it as long as this goes on. And secondly, the Helsinki, Helsinki Commission of the US State Department should put maximum pressure to have the official dates released which proved that Deming was in Turkey in the 90s, as well as other convincing evidence in the hands of the Turkish authorities, I know they have, like a video made of Deming raping one of the Turkish boys and used as blackmail towards the Netherlands. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Van der Plaats, uh, for your very extensive testimony. I'd like to now introduce our, our third uh, very distinguished witness, uh, the former head of the Dutch Department of Criminal Intelligence, who specialized in, as he points out in his statement, in major cases concerning organized crime, um, Mr. Landovin. Mr. Chairman, member of Congress, congressional staff members, I want to thank you for your kind investigation to be here today to, to explain my findings in a very de delicate matter. Ex approximately nine years ago, I was approached by the law firm Bakker Schutte van der Plas, who asked me to carry out an independent objective investigation in the case of the client, Mr. Hussein Bymachine. The investigation had to uh, examine, examine uh, alleged manipulation of wiretaps by the Dutch government, which in the, which in the Turkish case against Bymachine were used as well as possible blackmail by the Turkish government of member of the Dutch Justice Department in the Netherlands. At the start of my independent objective research, I wonder whether, whether, whether the th theory of the law firm was not a nonsense fairy tale story. I mused that this. Yes, yes. I mused that this uh, level of corruption could never occur in my country where I worked so hard uh, for fighting against organized crime. I set up my research based upon the uh, premise that the theory of the law firm was false. I've tried to prove this. This method is called the reverse burden of proof. If there is no proof for the uh, falsity of the theory, then the theory is correct. The research that I did in the Netherlands proved me that it was possible to manipulate wiretaps and also allowing innocent people to be found guilty. I completed my research in the Netherlands with the result that, uh, that a number of uh, science fix experts were studying in the results produced. Eventually, the Dutch uh, Justice Department hired an expert who was not qualified to carry out the research and came with his own conclusion. 
the results was that this expert gave a wrong assessment upon uh, which Pribosin was sentenced for life in prison. After the sentencing, I uh, continued my research at the request of the law firm Bakker Sutter van der Plas. I, don't I did not uh, limit my research to the Netherlands, but I did extend research in Turkey. I spoke with almost all the witnesses in this case, both in individuals and various government officials. I document uh, my fully uh, by both uh, video and audio tape testimony so that they could be used as evidence later. The result, the result of my research was shocking for, were shocking for me. By speaking with, with many witnesses, uh, a, a conspiracy became clear against Bibesin's the victim. There was a setup or cover up between the Turkish and the Dutch government officials uh, at the absolute highest level. The witness confirmed what the law firm kept telling me. The picture was what I thought was the following. A high level Dutch uh, justice official during the visits to Turkey requested that young boys be brought to him to order uh, to have sex with him. This was very ver ver verified and recorded by the Secret Intelligence Service of Turkey. A high-ranking high intelligence service officer gave me a copy of a Turkish report that explained the story of the Dutch of of justice official who had minors brought to the hotel room for sex and the blackmail that was carried out against him in the Netherlands by the Turkish authorities. I finished my report with the purpose of giving this to the Dutch government so it could be used to carry out in criminal investigation. We sought uh, to have an independent commission created to study this case and bring out all the facts. Uh, that committee was provided with all the available information. The commission also tried to, to reach the, the manipulated wiretaps in investigating them. The result was that uh, the wiretaps were found, uh, were found to be more than likely manipulated. However, the research was provided uh, that was provided was reacted as it was found not sanctified or convincing. This, this research uh, was never, getting, uh, was never uh, carried out uh, and thus the truth was never uh, reve re reve revealed. Sorry. Uh, at the moment that I uh, the decision was made uh, made by the commission to travel to Turkey uh, to in interview the witness again, the Justice Department uh, intervened again and blocked this from, uh, from happening. This research was uh, therefore never taken place and the truth never uh, revealed. Mrs. Van der Plas filed a police report on behalf of the Turk victims with the aim that the criminal investigation will be started into the conduct of the higher Dutch Justice of official Mr. Joris Demming. This type, this type of investigation in the Netherlands are carried out by the National Investigation Union. The National Investigation Union falls directly on the, the, the college of the pro prosecutors who meet regularly with Mr. Demming uh, as he is the secre Secretary General of, of the Justice Department. All, avail all available information uh, uh, were made available by Mrs. Van der Plas and myself at the National Investigation Union. We, we even have one of the Turkish victims travel to the uh, Netherlands to make a statement. In addi addition, we also had an important witness come from Turkey to the Netherlands to speak with the National Investigation Union. Uh, the, the result was, uh, as the leader of this National Investigation Union told us, that, uh, that there will be no criminal investigation. The National Investigation Union had uh, convinced uh, itself to also hold a fact collection and it had no authority uh, to do a proper investigation. Again, I missed opportunity to fully investigate the all uh, allegations in Turkey and, and, test and take testimony from the important witness did not happen. 
in the in the past years I have done uh, ex extensive research regarding more possible child abuse victims in, in high po uh, police and judicial offi officials in the Netherlands. From this research, it is being crystal clear to me that there is is and has been abuse of minors by high police justice official of officials, and that they all that they all effort to criminal investigations and prosecute these cases have been blocked and covered up. During my investigation, I came in contact with one of the victims who is here today and, uh, and has told his story. Up after serious uh, reflections, I have come to the conclusion that the Dutch government does not want, want uh, and will not investigate this very uh, sensitive issue of manipulating wiretaps under which someone is, is, is wrongfully uh, serving uh, life uh, sentences and about the young boys and the one of the highest offers official of the justice department. It, al it also my conclusion that after many, many years of uh, research by myself, the theory of the law firm Bakker Schut van der Plas is correct. The, their client, Mr. Hussein Weimersin, was framed uh, and several of Mr. van der Plas' other clients were abused by the Justice Department Secretary, Secretary General, Mr. George Deming, when they were a minor. My, my confidence that the Dutch government will ever carry out a fair independent investigation in these two issues is completely gone. I hope that you can, or the United States can help us in resolving this matter through diplomatic or uh, severe methods, methods in this very sensitive issue. What I what I will, will uh, what, hmm, what I would like to ask the Commission is threefold. First, pressure the Turkish authorities to release all the information about the blackmailing. Second, pressure the Turkish authorities to release the travel dates of Deming during the nineties. This will be resolved resolve the matter once and for all. And third, pressure the Turkish authorities to release the video made of Deming raping one of the Turkish boys. Thank you for your attention. <coughs> Thank you very much uh, for that, again, very extensive. And um, you set out to disprove and came to an opposite to conclusion. That's quite remarkable. Um, I'd like to now show a very brief video, and then we'll go to our fourth and final witness. Um, and that is a video uh, of police officer Kurt Mutz, who allegedly offered Demic security in Turkey uh, and kidnapped boys for him for abuse and also uh, Mustafa uh, who's uh, identifying Demic and we'll now watch that video.
Okay, we'll now go to our fourth uh, very distinguished witness, uh, Ms. Vardaman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Congressman Cohen, and um, to the Helsinki Commission and the Victims' Rights Caucus for keeping the spotlight on this critical issue of child sex trafficking. The victimization endured by this man as a child is heartbreaking. Shared Hope International has been working to develop responses to child sex trafficking, restore victims, and prevent victimization for 14 years. In 2006 to 2007, under a grant from the uh, U.S. Department of State Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons, Shared Hope researched sex trafficking markets in four countries. The Netherlands was one of those countries. The goal of that research was to identify commonalities that could refocus our efforts to fight trafficking on an issue basis as opposed to a regional basis. Well, the finding was the commonality is and was and continues to be demand. The second commonality is that um, exploitation of children through sex trafficking is occurring around the world and the Netherlands was no exception. The exploitation includes um, giving anything of value in exchange for pornography, uh, sexual performance, or prostitution. All three occur in nearly every country around the globe. Child sex trafficking and child sex tourism are happening in all parts of our world. And the reason is that demand exists for commercial sexual exploitation of children. Focusing on the findings in the Netherlands illustrates the scope of the problem. Legalized prostitution led to increased demand, and consequently a need for more supply, but there are a limited number of adults willing to enter the prostitution, quote, profession, and the deficiency is filled with trafficking victims. The ban on brothels was lifted in 2000 in the Netherlands. And just a few years later, the Amsterdam City Council recognized the dangers of trafficking, deciding to close 100 of the 350 prostitution windows in the red light district. Amsterdam's mayor stated, almost five years after the lifting of the brothel ban, we have to acknowledge that the aims of that law have not been reached. Lately, we've received more and more signals that abuse still continues. The police admit we are in the midst of modern slavery. In 2003, in the Netherlands, there were 257 registered victims of human trafficking. A 2004 media piece reported that the Amsterdam City Council was going to close the street prostitution zones. It also reported a public opinion poll taken on the issue of um, the resignation of one of the council members because he had been found to have purchased prostitution in that same street zone. 73% of the citizens believe that public officials should not be stigmatized for buying prostitution. And 63% believe the council members' actions were a private matter and certainly not the grounds for resignation. This is what we call a culture of tolerance, and we find that where it exists, it makes the job of fighting trafficking that much harder. In 2004, about 8,000 prostitutes worked in Amsterdam alone, and some two-thirds of those were of foreign origin. In 2005, Dutch police received more than 600 reports of women who may have been forced into prostitution and 400 women contacted anti-trafficking organizations for assistance. In 2007, there were 343 registered victims of sex trafficking. 25% of those were under 18 years old. At the time of our research in 2006 and 2007, there was reportedly no police presence between 12 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the official red light district in Amsterdam a time which one trafficking victim who suffered her experiences there called, quote, a black market of prostitution when children became readily available. Only five to six police officers worked in the entire red light district at that time. There was no capacity for investigating the illegal trafficking occurring. 
This was an iceberg with legal prostitution at the top, masking the vast illegal activity beneath. The Dutch Criminal Code in 2005 extended jurisdiction to reach citizens committing child sex tourism. That is sexual exploitation of a child outside the Netherlands. But in the Netherlands, there continued to be increasing amount of pimping, uh, organized crime, and um, exploitation of children. In a 2005 news report, a former vice officer in the red light district reported that the two primary groups of pimps working in that red light district were called, quote, lover boys and, quote, the Turks. He reported that law enforcement officers had three months to complete investigations, a wholly insufficient amount of time for these complicated crimes. Shared Hope's partner, Scarlett Cord, worked in the red light district in Amsterdam doing outreach and services to trafficking victims. They identified the lover boy problem early on and began to put programs into schools to, um, to educate and to prevent the recruitment of these mostly teenage victims. The lover boy pimping method is very similar to modern trafficking in the US, relying on emotional bondage rather than physical force to maintain control over their young victims. In our research in the Netherlands, victims reported also that quote, magic was used to entice them. But this is not limited to the ne Netherlands, and it's certainly not limited to any one country. A weak link in the global dragnet and safety net will prevent us from protecting the victims of child sex trafficking. As Congressman Smith noted at the start of this briefing, traffickers rely on the ability to frighten children and keep them quiet and it's imperative that the justice system be ready now to listen to allegations and to thoroughly investigate them. Shared Hope has um, highlighted some promising practices through our research here in the United States in the last five years. Promising practice, practices to develop proper responses to child sex trafficking. Some of these are happening in other countries already, and all of them are transferable to any country willing to take them on. First, the presence of school resource officers within schools to help build trust between law enforcement and children undermines the traffickers' ability to scare their victims by, uh, into distrusting law enforcement. Education at all levels of the justice system, from investigation to trial, will lead to more identifications of child sex trafficking victimization and better responses. Above all, victim-centered approaches to interviewing and investigation are critical to a child's confidence to disclose their victimization. A few examples exist that were, are worthy of highlighting. The Dallas Police Department has a high-risk victims unit in which the process is to flag a, a file of a child who is a repeat runaway and direct that file straight to this high-risk victims unit where there are child forensic interviewers ready to, invest, to investigate with proper child uh, approaches. Gang units like the Fairfax County Gang Unit in Northern Virginia are being trained in sex trafficking identification and victim interviewing that can separate the victim from the influence and gag control of the gang. Human trafficking task forces across the US and in other countries bring together service providers and law enforcement to ensure victims are supported and encouraged to seek justice. And lastly, victim witness coordinators in the majority of federal law enforcement offices across the country ensure the victim is supported through the investigation and trial process. Shared Hope International has developed the Protected Innocence Challenge, which, though domestic, has, has relevance for the world. Um, it includes a framework of laws for effective responses to child sex trafficking. The framework credits those states that have laws in place providing for victim protections and support through the investigation and trial process. Currently, 34 states in the United States currently have some protection, and all are being encouraged to enact more laws, which will ensure that more victims are heard. And finally, as I stated several times throughout, attacking demand. Demand is the root of the problem, and we have heard about the exploitation today of children firsthand from the 
people representing them. And if we could focus some of that effort on demand, maybe this wouldn't have occurred in the first place. Resources and prioritization of fighting demand are critical and lead to corroboration of a victim's complaint, less reliance on victim testimony, and hopefully and ultimately a reduction in the number of children exploited. Child sex trafficking is a threat to our society's health, undoubtedly, and it's truly a national and international security threat as well. It allows organized crime to prey on the most vulnerable until we all, as a global community and individually within our nations, our state, our cities, get serious about stopping demand. This fight has no end. Thank you for continuing to keep this issue at the forefront. <clears throat> thank you very much, and thank you for the outstanding work that Shared Hope International has done and continues to do. Um, I, you know, I noted in reading your, Mr. Cohen, do you have any questions? Thank you so much. I noted in your, your report, uh, you point out that the women in this area talking about one of the red light districts are mostly Latin and South American uh, uh, from Colombia, Cuba, Brazil, and Venezuela. I was on in, um, in Brasilia on a trip years ago uh, to talk about a, an effort to get the Brazilians to pass a comprehensive strategy on combating sex trafficking to protect their own children because child sex tourism is so huge there. Uh, I met with parliamentarians um, in Brasilia for several days, but we made a one-day trip to uh, Rio de Janeiro and went to a shelter. And while I was at the shelter, there was a woman from Brazil uh, who had just been rescued with tears pouring from her eyes, uh, rescued a couple of days earlier, but as she told her story, she was en route to Amsterdam. And I have raised this issue myself with the Dutch as head of delegation for the United States uh, Parliamentary Assembly, uh, as chairman of this commission, uh, that, and as you point out in your report, uh, when you get two-thirds or more, some put it as high as 80 percent or higher, of the women being foreign, um, even the indigenous Dutch uh, women, it is highly suspect as to at what level of coercion have they been brought there. But when so many people from other countries are, are present, uh, it, it begs the question about the, uh, and there have been the rapporteur's report in previous years that strongly suggest uh, that there are levels, and I would suggest high degrees of levels of uh, force, fraud, and coercion involved. And I saw it myself with the one rescued woman uh, who was in a shelter in Rio de Janeiro who was saved from that nightmare of being uh, uh, sent as a slave to Amsterdam. I would like to ask, uh, if you could, Ms. Mardivan, uh, you know, Ms. Van der Plaats in her statement, in one of her two asks was that uh, Holland be removed from Tier 1. Um, your thoughts on that? Still on. Um, <clears throat> I think that the, the assessment of tier placement is a complicated one, and I would defer <laughs> I would defer. What I would say, though, is that it is clear that efforts are in place in the Netherlands and in the United States and in other Tier 1 countries that do reflect uh, an intention to address trafficking. Whether those, those efforts are reaching their goal, I think, is a different question. Let me uh, ask uh, Mr. B if he could. Uh, you mentioned that you were not allowed to leave Amsterdam uh, by your pimp. What would have happened had you left Amsterdam? Do you know of anybody who escaped, and what happened to them? Uh, can you do the same? Yes. Uh, what would have What would have happened have had you been able to leave Amsterdam after your exploitation? Do you know of any others who did? Oof, uh, I would have been punished. Uh, how? Uh, Beatings. Sorry. You would have been beaten, or yeah beaten or worse. Do you know anybody who was maltreated, who tried to escape? Uh, no, I can only speak for my own. In your presentation, you stated that various high-ranking Dutch officials were part of a pedophile ring contained in Professor Van Roon's Rolodex, and that you made extensive reports to the police during the investigation. Were there any law enforcement officials suspected in the investigation or other officials that might have been in place to stop that investigation? Yes. 
Was your pimp or anyone else ever charged as part of that investigation? Uh, I don't know. You don't know, okay. Your presentation indicates that you were prostituted at the festival bar in Amsterdam along with other boys. Can you tell us what has happened to the festival bar after your police report? Was it shut down and were the boys rescued? Uh, the festival bar has changed the name and there are still boys working. Notwithstanding your complaint. You know, could you tell us what the name of it is now? Uh, do you know? Uh, no, I, I, I don't know the name, sorry. Now, you're obviously being, you know, we are seeking to hide your identity to the greatest extent possible. Are you fearful of any retaliation because you have presented testimony here before the Helsinki Commission? Um, I don't know what happened with me if I go back to, uh, to the Netherlands, if I arrive at the airport. I talked about it with my attorney. Thank you, Mr. B. Ms. Van der Plus, if I could ask you, in your presentation, you mentioned a previous case, of course, the Rolodex case, that you believe shows a pattern of investigations being shut down by Mr. Dem uh, Demick. You mentioned that, quote, according to the leading investigators in the case, as soon as Demick became a person of interest in this matter, the investigation was shut down and that the sting operation to catch the man who identified it uh, Mr. B was compromised. This information came from leading investigators in the case, did it? And yes. how many investigators on the case were willing to speak with you about this? One investigator visited my office and told me his whole story and he told me this. He was uh, in the preliminary investigation and he knew very well that this Mr. Deming was one of the suspects. And he said we had some unofficial wire tapping and we heard all the people speaking, but at the moment we started the official investigation, it was, all the communication was closed down. So it couldn't be different than there was a leak. And also he said, when we went to this middleman, uh, this Mr. Van Roon, uh, uh, uh, he was waiting for us. He was waiting for us and uh, his whole house was clean. So it was very clear, he told us, oh, there you are, we are waiting you. And he also told me that uh, the victim who is now testifying to you gave him very re reliable inf information at the time that he found back when he did his searches. And a question you asked the victim, I can tell you that in that case, one pimp was um, uh, convicted, uh, not very large uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, um, a sentence, uh, one of it was conditional, and the condition was for a part of the, pres uh, the prison sentence he could work in a kind of uh, farm where children came. So the policeman who told me that, that was still so angry. The policemen who worked on that case are really frustrated, and uh, I also heard, but that was through a middleman, a, a journalist who told me that the, the, the, the, the chief of the investigation team, a man who really believed in God and, and in good life, he, he told the journalist, I can't speak. I go every Sunday to the church to sing it away from me. That's what policemen say. And I know that uh, Mr. Langendoorn next to me spoke even to other investigators who, of that team at that time who confirmed exact that information, isn't it? Yeah. You mentioned that the current State Secretary of Justice, Fred Tevin, is that how you say it? Taven. Taven, stated under oath in 2007 that high-ranking Dutch officials in the Rolodex case were never prosecuted because the investigation was blocked. Was there an investigation, Mr. Mr. Tevin's allegation that the investigation Uh, did, did, any, did anybody look into why it was blocked? Uh, uh, no, nobody ever looked in. It's also this, this case was kept silent. And it was very special that our State Secretary of Justice, Mr. Taven, brought that under oath in, an, in a complete different case. He said this was what happened. And what's also interesting that in 1999, Mr. Taven, when he was still intelligence prosecutor, he was prosecutor in that case, he uh, gave an interview to a magazine for lawyers 
and he said there, it's my knowledge as prosecutor of intelligence uh, uh, cases that uh, it's known to me, the information I gathered, that criminal organizations in the Netherlands have um, uh, um, influence on politicians and even on judges. So when you hear that, it's terrifying. He then was still prosecutor. But the problem is, since Mr. Uh, Taven is Secretary of State, we don't hear him anymore. So what happened, I asked Dan, because this is what he said, and that's published, I, we even can show you if you would like, he said that then, that he has information, because when you see, when this happened in Turkey, that foreign intelligence agencies have influence, can blackmail our uh, uh, uh, government, and our, that, that's, that's terrifying, but not only them. When criminal organizations deliver kits to those the people, the, to people in a, a so high ranking inside the government, a prosecution office and justice system, then those criminal organizations also have a mean to blackmail those people. And that's going on for a long time when this already happened in the 90s. And even our state secretary told that to a judge, told that in public, and nothing happened. The situation with, with Mr. Babason, and, and maybe uh, Klaus, you might want to speak to this as well. <coughs> All of us are well aware of, of the intensity of the feelings of Turks for Kurds and vice versa. Yeah. I'll never forget after the first Persian Gulf War when Kurds had made their way to the border. Uh, I went over there while it was still a very volatile situation and saw as these poor people were on the border being helped by our special forces and others to simply survive. Yes. Um, there, there were, the, the Turks barely allowed them to be across the border. That was the and so, so my, my point is, you know, the backdrop of, of that issue and, you know, the quid pro quo, perhaps allegation, that that led to the blackmailing and, and the, um, in the situation. That, that's very yes. clear because Please, Mr. Mr. Deming was member of this EU K4 committee right. and he was specially uh, uh, responsible for the Kurdish-Turkish conflict. So he had this direct connection with the Turks. And this Mr. Bybesin, this Turkish activist, was busy to, uh, to let their, the Kurds have a, a better life. And some of them who couldn't have that to run away from there. So in that way, they were a kind of opponents. And that's why the Turkish government at the time said, we see this Bybesin uh, as a real main uh, object. Uh, we want to silence him. And you have to help us because we caught you with those kids. And that's also what Mr. Langerdun heard in Turkey. But this whole political thing behind it is very clear. And then it's so strange that Mr. Deming said, I didn't visit Turkey since 87. He was the main person in the Netherlands uh, with this, uh, who, who, who was dealing with this Kurdish-Turkish conflict. And had well, I think your point that an ambassador to another country uh, would hardly stay in Washington. They would be traveling in and back and forth, or would be staying there, of course. But in this case, when that's your duties, it would, it, it would be a dereliction of those duties not to be traveling to Turkey. I think that was a very, very yeah. important internal strength to your, to your argument. Yeah. Uh, do you, can you give any indication as to why the current Turkish leadership, uh, when the, these uh, Turkish boys were so allegedly abused and exploited and raped, uh, wouldn't find it in their own interest to protect uh, you know, a Turkish citizen and not want to say, whatever happened before, uh, so be it, but uh, you know, and that's so be it. Whatever happened before, you know, wherever that goes, uh, you know, we want to protect our own children and now young adults. Yes, you could say so, but at that moment, the Turkish government, uh, uh, that was not the, the Nowadays government, but, right. but was focusing on, on this Bible scene. They wanted oh, sure. to that government, but this government, it seems yes. to me, and, and the, you know, the Turkish this, government this, now yeah. more and more has spoken out against combating human trafficking. And this is the case of their own kids. And, and that's why they gave oh. Mr. Langerdun so much information. So we, we, all our sources are from Turkey, official sources, other sources, isn't it, Mr. Okay. That's why they want to help us, but they, in the same time, they are forced by diplomatic pressure not to give everything, just to give pieces. That's why we are hanging in between I for see. so many years already. Yeah. 
Now, the Major Daly that may very shortly, if you want to speak to that, Klaus? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The um, Major Daly or the Major Newspaper, um, will this be a, a, a breakthrough in terms of finally Telegraph. bringing some light and scrutiny to the issue? This, this, uh, that will come, yes, because that is going to speak about, uh, by the way, all the investigations Mr. Langendoen did, and there are new Dutch victims who spoke that, about what happened to them. And that's coming very soon, huh? isn't it? Yeah. I'd just ask you if I could, uh, Ms. Van der Plaas, um, you talked about Mustafa. Uh, you mentioned uh, that, because I have met with the ambassador of the Netherlands to the United States. I do believe in hearing from all sides and doing my due diligence. Um, matter of fact, he did mention in his letter uh, the Tier 1 status as if that somehow exonerated uh, a country, and that would apply to any country. Um, you know, that may show a good trend, but if there are individual cases that need to be looked into, they need to be. But that said, um, you know, that says nothing about this case. Um, but, you know, he, um, you talked about Mustafa. He did not feel safe in traveling to the Netherlands. You mentioned contra-actions, I think was the phrase you used. Contra-actions was the Rolodex case. Okay, okay. But the contra-actions in... Okay, yeah. with Mustafa, it was with safety. He, was, he wanted a guarantee of safety, and he also wanted uh, a lawyer present. Yes, uh, that's what I wrote to the prosecutor. And, and then the prosecutor. Why wouldn't the lawyer be allowed to be present with, with someone who wants to come forward like that? Yes. When I asked the prosecutor, and I have it all in correspondence available, uh, I said because of the threats the boy had, he, uh, I would like to be present or his Turkish lawyer. and. And we want security, and because he is giving a statement against the highest man at the Ministry of Justice. And for this kid, as a Turkish citizen, he knows they, those people have power. And then he wrote back, Mrs. van der Plaas, this is, dit is Nederland. That means this is the Netherlands. <laughs> so, no. And I couldn't guarantee my client full safety when he came, so the, the, the kid was terrified, really scared to that. Yeah. With regards to uh, the Turkish prosecution office in Diyar Bakir, you said they now have an active investigation against Mr. Demek, and two of the individuals uh, worked with Turkey. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Uh, um, how long has that been going on? And, and uh, this is very recently recent. uh, started, uh, somewhere this spring, because the Turkish authorities want something, and then all the time <coughs> delay. And, and, and that's why I'm waiting now with this appeal that I got the information from them. But uh, I know that exactly last week they, they made some movement, and they're going to listen to some witnesses. So there is now some progress in it and and i i think when from united states side there is support for what they're going to do in this respect that would help them really let me ask you have you been threatened have, have you been personally been threatened yourself at no all? no but I, I i don't even see it when where i'm not uh, what do you call it available for that or open for that <laughs> yeah yeah let me ask you one final question um you mentioned <clears throat> that a current member of the Turkish State Security Council, Mr. Salibi, yes. uh, of the military wing of the Turkish Intelligence Service, sent to the Netherlands a list of the many visits he believed Mr. Demek uh, made to Turkey between 95 and 03. Uh, however, the Netherlands has dismissed the report, never contacted the author, uh, who remains a special security advisor for, among other things, the Turkish Minister of the Interior. Uh, could you speak further on that? Why would such information uh, be shelved or, or, or refused to be acted upon, or is it being acted upon in any way? And uh, did this Mr. Salibi run a risk in providing that information uh, himself? Uh, Mr. Salibi made this report? Because, because uh, again, in my conversations with the Dutch, they say that he just wasn't there. <laughs> and that, you know, exonerates him, and, and as you have pointed out, and others have I, pointed I, out, he came under aliases, made, he came I, other ways. I made some attachments for your commission. Over His ACK report is in there, and page 23 gives the dates that, according, he was the first one to reveal the dates that, that Deming entered uh, uh, uh, Turkey in the, 70, in the 90s, and how everything happened. But I also uh, attached his letter to the Dutch authorities, this independent commission Mr. Langendoen spoke about, and he offered in that, he said who he was, and he offered to give all the information. But nobody ever asked him 
to, to do so and to give it. So what we gave, it was ignored. It was ignored, and, and we give that to you. So what he said, and, and I was visiting Mr. Celebi even with Mr. Uh, uh, uh, Langedun, and we discussed his report. We have photos of that. Yeah. And we have also, a f he gave us also a photo showing, look, I, I, I write this letter that I was a special advisor of the Minist Minister of Interior in Turkey at that time, but here, look me on the airport with this uh, um, actually second person in the AK party. <laughs> so this is really someone not to ignore, but the Dutch just didn't even think about it. When I would have been Ministry of Justice in the Netherlands, I'm not, I should have said, okay, I, the first thing I do is transparently, openly ask the Turkish government what is about uh, this report. They never did, just ignored. Is it a cover-up? Is it a cover-up? Uh, what a cover-up? Uh, you mean that they don't do anything? Right. Uh, what, we, what we see all the time in this case, whatever we bring in, in fact, Silence is after that. We are ignored. Mr. Langdon, uh, let me ask you a question. You indicate that after f years in the criminal justice system in the Netherlands, you were very surprised by the facts presented to you by um, Ms. Van der Plus and her uh, legal unit regarding the conviction of Babasan and its relationship to the allegations against a high-ranking just justice official. You said, and I quote, at the start of your independent research, you wondered if the theory of the law firm was not a nonsense fairy tale story, and you assumed that this level of corruption could never occur in your country, uh, where you had worked so hard against organized crime. Close quote. Uh, is your assessment? Is it your assessment that this case is an aberration from what is normal in the Netherlands, or is it a sign of a systemic problem uh, with organized crime? Yeah. I was shocked. Um, I put on I your. Oh, sorry. I, I was shocked about what I heard from the, the, the, those uh, two lawyers uh, when they asked me to do some investigation about that. I said, it's a, it's a fairy tale. Uh, I, I know uh, Holland very well about uh, uh, organized crime, all that kind of thing. That, that those things doesn't happen uh, in Holland. That was my opinion at, at that moment. But they asked me, uh, class, uh, please do the investigation. But we believe in, we believe in the story. Uh, and after that, I, I, I must say, uh, uh, I think it's true. That, you were that, that, that, yeah. the, that the Dutch uh, government uh, are blackmailed uh, in the story of the, of the, of the, uh, of the highest ranking uh, man of, of justice. You mentioned that the National Investigations Unit did only a facts collection investigation, but had no authority to do a proper investigation. What additional options and powers would have been open to an investigator if they had been empowered to open an official investigation, just so we understand the differences? Uh, which witnesses did they not interview as a result of the limited investigation? Oh, I asked uh, the head of, the, uh, of that uh, investigation. Uh, I gave him all the information. I said, uh, I can give you uh, the, the, the, the people who, uh, who must uh, do this investigation. I traveled them to Turkey. I have got very good contacts uh, during these days in contact, in intelligence service, police, uh, everything. I can introduce them. Jake, you can do a very good investigation. He said, no, no, we do nothing. And why do you think that's the case? Uh, he said, "He said we, we don't see anything for the, uh, no facts for a criminal investigation. And then we don't we don't do any uh, criminal investigation. And when there is not a criminal investigation, I can do any, I can can do anything. But, but given your extraordinary credibility and the fact that you are a man who has made a difference in in meting out justice in in Holland, uh, yes. didn't that add to, you know, the imperative that they do something? I mean, you were presenting something." Um, I mean, you set out to disprove. You didn't think it was real. Then you uh, came to. Uh, it seems to me that I that pressed him. I said, "I've got all the information for you. Uh, I, I can travel with you to Turkey. We, you, we can speak to the victims, to the, to the police officers, intelligence officers." And I, uh, he said, "No, no, no I, I'm not allowed to do that. Not allowed. Not allowed. Under that's, that's pain it. of being fired or reprimanded in some way. Do you think? Or, or I, d I don't know. You I don't, don't know. know. I don't okay. Know. Okay." Um, I'd like to yield to um, 
without objection to our one of our counsels on the Helsinki Commission, uh, Alison Hobart. Alison. Thank you all for being here today. Mr. Um, Langendon, what is the current status of the Babasan case? Uh, the, you did extensive research into um, evidence tampering with the wiretaps. Has there been any movement in the Dutch government on looking into this case any further to see if there was any miscarriage of justice? Uh, maybe yeah. I will, uh, uh, because yeah. there, there happened something in that case now. Till now, they refused completely to do anything. We asked again and again for uh, investigating the, the, because the man was convicted uh, on only telephone tapes. And Mr. Uh, Langadun even interviewed in Turkey also a, a, a policeman who said, I was helping the Dutch to manipulate those telephone tapes at the time. But uh, they refused till now to do an investigation, but we made a revision request to the Supreme Court of the conviction of Mr. Bybesen, and that revision request was done April 2011. And only recently, and we brought in all the evidence we have, and we have a lot, and recently, in uh, August 2011, uh, the Attorney General of the Supreme Court said, uh, uh, uh, I require to the Supreme Court an, uh, that I can do a new investigation into this case because there is so much material, but we want to verify that material. And just recently, uh, the day we left for uh, uh, Washington, that was Monday or no, Tuesday, I got information from the Supreme Court that they made a quick decision. It was planned on 30th of, of October, but they made it last Tuesday, and they said the prosecutor by new, the attorney general of the uh, Supreme Court, by the new law, can do this investigation itself. So I think now that the attorney general, different than the prosecution office, sees the value of what we have already, and uh, he is now starting an investigation. And we just can hope that this will be a real investigation. He wrote in his conclusion very precisely that he wants to involve the defense very much because also he believes in rule of law. But he said, I almost can't believe that this happened in my country, but let's go and investigate it. So this is a new development, but very recent. Actually, last week before we left. Yeah. Yeah. Now, will this be a full investigation or a fact-finding investigation or in a completely different type? Because it's it is a, a very special investigation in our uh, uh, criminal law. Uh, uh, it is a uh, uh, and it is just by new law, 1st of October, made possible. And it is a fact-finding uh, investigation by the highest attorney uh, uh, general of the, of the Supreme Court into the facts we brought, the new facts for the revision. So that will be the telephone tapes, but that will also be the interrogation of a translator who knew everything and who said that this Bibesin was a purpose of, of the Turkish government. So he's going to interview witnesses and he wants to make a new investigation on the telephone tapes and all the irregularities which you can hear already, but then to investigate it really. So it can take some time, but it will be very interesting. And of course, then you can't walk along Mr. Deming's role anymore either. Yeah. Ms. Vardaman. You mentioned in your statement that legalized prostitution led to increased demand and thus a need for greater supply um, in relation to the Netherlands' legalization of, of prostitution in the year 2000. You also did a study of several other countries at the same time in your two, of your 2007 study. Did you also see a similar pattern there, if, if any of them similarly legalized, or do you have any other examples of uh, legalization leading to greater demand? The other three countries, Japan, Jamaica, and the United States, um, do not have legalized prostitution and did not at that time, uh, except for the rare situation in the state of Nevada where several counties still have um, brothels, legal brothels. Um, and that was really the only thing we could compare to uh, in that research. However, it did play out similarly in, in our research in Nevada Las Vegas was one of the cities we focused on, 
And that definitely was a line of questioning that we had when we went into Las Vegas. And the similar um, feeling and evidence came out that there was an increase in demand for commercial sexual activity in those places where it is legal. And, um, and that included those counties in Nevada where they saw actually people leaving the city of Las Vegas to travel out to the nearest county that, dis that does have legalized prostitution um, for that purpose. Uh, before we conclude, and I would ask if there's anything else you would like to uh, share with us, I, I do want to um, mention that we did invite Ambassador at Large for Human Trafficking, uh, Lucy DeBaca, to be here today. Uh, I have called over to the office, as has the staff, several times specifically on this case, uh, and I have not heard back from them, which is disappointing, because I wrote the law that created that position, both the office and the Ambassador at Large, and no call back. Um, and, and, you know, again, whether a country be a great friend in the United States or something less than that, uh, friends don't let friends commit human rights abuses. And if, there, if this is an aberration or if this is a pattern, uh, there are real victims, including the very courageous Mr. B, who's right over here, uh, who have suffered and carry those scars. And, and we need to speak truth to power wherever it is, including our own country here in the United States. So I, I, um, uh, I note that with disappointment that they're not here uh, to uh, be at this table to speak to this very important issue, um, but we will stay at that. Uh, we do, since this is a briefing and not a formal hearing, we do entertain questions. Um, so if there is uh, anyone who would like to uh, raise a question with our very distinguished witnesses or me, uh, please proceed. Yes. Are you, would you take a, a, a Do you want to take the microphone at the end of the dais there? Hello. Hi, my name is Kwame Fosu, and I'm the policy director for the Rebecca Project for Human Rights. And um, thank you for holding this very important hearing. Uh, we are very um, grateful, and thank you for coming, Adele, um, class, and um, B. Um, what is the process? Um, we know that um, the Netherlands has been cited by the United Nations as one of the top ten tourist sex to um, destinations, oh sorry, one of the um, top ten destinations for sex tourism. What is the process of changing their, their rating from a tier one country to a tier two or tier three? What is the, the actual process? How do we do this? Because sure. it's very important to the Rebecca Project that people like Yoris Demick, who actually are in charge of prosecuting human trafficking, do come to justice, and we want to make sure that advocates in the United States are aware of this and know how we can, we can take steps to change the rating. And so we want to know what's Great question. Um, first of all, as I think many of you know, we established what we called minimum standards in the 2000 Act. We built on those in the 03, the 05, and then the more recent Act, adding to information as to what what the backdrop is that we use in our data calls to our embassies in finding out whether or not there are prosecutions, complicity by government officials, how well or poorly the military is doing, uh, are they complicit in trafficking, and, and it's a very comprehensive look. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, in 2000, we, we were focusing on arrests, uh, but we didn't get to the conviction part, and some countries actually gamed the system. Uh, and did arrest, but they weren't doing anything about jail time. Uh, so we changed that in subsequent uh, laws. The process, very simply, after that backdrop, looking at the facts, then applying uh, what's happening on the ground with those standards, uh, the minimum standards as we call them, and they are minimum, they're not maximum, they're minimum, but they're very important, uh, is for the Department of State to make a call uh, based on that information as to whether or not they are Tier 1, Tier 2, watch list, or egregious violators, which would be Tier 3. Uh, the, the process today, or the, the, the designation of any country, can be changed on any day if the data warrants it. It is customarily done after the TIP report is released. 
There's a section that, that has all countries ranked, including the United States. Uh, but frankly, if, if information comes forward suggesting that there is reason for a demotion or a change, a, you know, an improvement, uh, a tier ranking can be changed on any day of the week of any month of the year. So Holland could be changed uh, if the Department of State and the TIP office so desired it today or tomorrow or any other day. But it, we did, by design, as Congress, did not make tier callings. We felt that it would be best done by each of our embassies feeding into the TIP office itself. Uh, and as we all know, there is a, a political struggle within the Department of State. There are many ambassadors who, who don't want their country being designated tier three. Uh, there's a great deal of pushback. I think that's unfortunate. It ought to be all about the Mr. B's and the victims because there is a two-part strategy there. First, the designation, and then what do you do with it? Uh, there are a number of actions that can be taken in terms of penalties, uh, and hopefully the penalties will be commensurate with the tier rating. But if a country does start to make some real progress, uh, and, and, and we've had a number of countries that have done that, great allies like Israel and South Korea were tier three countries, and Israel moved heaven and earth to close brothels and to make sure that women, especially in Tel Aviv, were not being exploited. And in like manner, South Korea pa passed a number of important laws uh, and policies uh, to mitigate trafficking, uh, particularly sex trafficking, in that country. Uh, so, you know, it's all about making the call based on the facts. I have argued for a long time that, that Holland does not deserve to be on tier one because of the enormously large number of women uh, and boys and young people who are exploited in the 13, as, as uh, Ms. Vardaman told us, red light districts uh, in, in, in that country. And um, you know the, the line of demarcation between a trafficking victim and a woman who purports to be there on her own volition is very threadbare indeed. Uh, there are levels of forced fraud and coercion uh, that, that could be easily missed uh, by someone who is inclined to think it's all okay. And added to that, anyone who has not attained the age of 18. So all of these young boys that are being exploited, and young girls, in Amsterdam, in the facility that is still, or the brothel that still has people in it with a different name, um, is, is a trafficking crime. Because you know one commercial sex act, our definition in the law, uh, and anyone who has not attained the age of 18, is by definition a sex trafficking victim. So I would encourage, even admonish, the administration to rethink its tier one designation, but I've done that before and have gotten nowhere. Thank you for the question. Yes, please. Dr. Cassie Bevan, I used to work in this committee, and for you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to know, given um, the fact that we don't really have jurisdiction over Holland, um, and there, there is no real nexus for us to be able to make much change in another country, um, how do we enforce, I mean, one, how, do we, how would we keep the Secretary General or anyone else who's an offender out of the United States? Um, and you know, what kind of resolution, what kind of enforcement could we in the United States have as a Congress to be able to keep someone out? Um, and the other is to how can we get Holland and other countries that have, that have voluntarily entered into agreements, um, such as the Palermo uh, Protocols, why, uh, why is not, you know, how do you get um, countries to follow their own agreements that they've agreed to enforce in their own countries? I mean, everybody is saying, you know, your threes, your three Ps, your protect, uh, prevent, um, and prosecute, but you know, we're not seeing it. And I think it's outrageous that the TIP office doesn't respond to the chairman of a com committee like this and the author of the bill, who is much esteemed by everyone in this room and in a, every place. So that's outrageous. Thank you, uh, Cassie. Is that for me or the others or for all of us? Well, I'll just take a couple. Of, okay, yeah, please. Is it other post? To understand well, you say you can have nice regulations, but when something is behind it, like hidden, 
that even uh, policemen are forced to, si to, to silent down. That's the point. I think it's very important that, uh, that the facts we bring now are included in the conversations, in the estimations. And that's the only thing to do, because you can make rules. But uh, that's what I say. I'm educated in, in a country where, I, yeah, rule of law and so on. But when you see then the reality and the practice, that can really uh, frustrate. And, and it's very important, like you as a chairman already said, we have to listen to the victims. But it's also very important in a country like the Netherlands that, that and that's what I saw those last years very clearly, that people working as policemen, really honest policemen, even honest prosecutors, I have them seen in my office, sometimes with tears in their eyes, that they could not go on. They were scared. They lose some lost their jobs because they didn't want to go on. It's very important that we find a way to support the good people in those systems who want to do something. And that, and when policemen are forced to show, to close their mouths, that we find a way to, to support them, to help them. And that's a very difficult thing, because what you see is that people shut their mouths and say, okay, Mrs. van der Plas, I know much more, but I'm not going to tell you till I'm retired, because I'm still scared for my profession, for my little house, I have children. This is, at the moment, a mentality in the Netherlands, and that was shocking me. And I think people have to come out, and the people who come out has to be supported. You have to say, okay, when you deny it, give, here are facts, and, and what, what are your facts? So that's why we come here, because there was a bit of disc, uh, discrepancy between that she says, yes, but the, uh, the Netherlands are doing a lot of effort in new laws and things like that. I don't deny that. I just say what's happening behind the screens that makes, it's like you paint your ceiling white, but the roof is still has holes and the water pours in. That's the whole problem. And how do we find a solution for that? I, I would add that there's no statute of limitations on rape and exploitation of young children <laughs> Uh, as I said in my opening, I can't think of a more egregious crime against a human being than rape, and then rape of a child. Uh, and we know with the victims that it, the, the scars are, are, are lifelong, can perhaps never be mitigated, but they, we need to stand with them that there's justice for those who commit these crimes. The importance of a hearing like this is to try to bring light and scrutiny, to try to persuade the Dutch government, who is a close ally of the United States, uh, that this is an embarrassment. Um, and if we're wrong, if this information is not correct, if this is some grand conspiracy, the purpose of which I can't even begin to think why, I mean, before we decided to do this, we did our due diligence on our side. Um, and that doesn't mean we have absolutely everything, but that's why we have asked for an investigation that will go, that will go on beyond the cursory. And that, to have a man of Klaus's stratus, uh, stratus, status, I should say, a man who, you know, who made it his business to put criminals away for life, um, you know, that, that have committed terrible crimes, uh, brings an enormous amount of credibility, as do you all. Uh, and, and to hear from the victims themselves is numbing. Um, in terms of what we should do, our own tip office needs should be here. It's not. I will ask again uh, that they engage on this. Maybe they have, and I'd love to see the information. I wanted it before we actually had this briefing. Um, our appeal is to the government, and I hope that they will respond, and it would indicate if the Attorney General takes this up that you know, for their own reasons, because they care about yes. justice. So you care about yeah. Holland is a rule of law country. Uh, and again, with regards to tears, um, as I said before, uh, we did not mince designating our best friends in the world who are at risk. South Korea with the threat in the north. Um, Israel, who is a, our greatest ally in the Middle East, and close, the, the only democracy in the Middle East, was on tier three during the Bush administration. Uh, and I always applauded that courage to do that. Uh, and I would note parenthetically that this 
bill, and Cassie remembers this because she worked with us to help get it enacted in the first place, uh, was vigorously opposed by the Clinton administration. On the record, Harold Coe sat where you sat, who's now Consular at State. They did not want to have the naming of names because it is embarrassing, it complicates all the niceties of statecraft, and they do not want sanctions. My argument is everyone will agree if it's all done in the abstract to combating trafficking, not so when you really do the data calls, you do the hard work and say there are people, victims like, um, you know, like Mr. B, uh, who that's why we do this law, period. And uh, so, so naming is important, and I hope the TIP office takes a good look at this and reviews this. Finally, I am the special representative for the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly. I do think it is my job in that capacity uh, to raise these issues in the hope that very well-meaning and, and, and people committed to the rule of law, which we know the Dutch government has, as you pointed out, Ms. van der Plaats, there are these great policemen who are frustrated. Really? Um, just do it right, you know, and we're trying to perform some support for that. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm H.P. Schijnemarkers. I'm Councillor for Justice and Home Affairs at the Netherlands Embassy. Um, just for the record, I wanted to make one comment, please, if you allow me. And that is that contrary to the impression that the panel might have given you, uh, the Netherlands takes the fight against child sex trafficking very seriously. And we could have commented um, if we uh, would have been invited to this panel. Um, but it wasn't until we protested uh, b not being included on this one-sided uh, panel uh, that you came back last Monday offering us the opportunity to ask the first question and send in a written statement. So since uh, just asking a question or giving a short remark like this one doesn't compensate for the one-sidedness, uh, we declined to do so. We did, however, uh, send in uh, the letters that the Minister of Security and Justice has sent to the Dutch Parliament, and I would refer to them. Thank you. Can I ask you, please, if you don't mind, was there anything you heard today that caused you to rethink that perhaps there is a very credible story here? I think that I'm not on the panel, so that's not the way to, uh, to address questions to me. But oh, it's a give and take. This is not a hearing, um, and and you you have the floor, and I'm asking you a very serious question. I'm, I'm gave, uh, I was in the, the process of giving you an answer, but I wanted to make that clear first, and that is that um, the information that has been given today is uh, has all been available, and therefore I think it's good that uh, Mrs. Van der Plas indicated that she's came, going to take this uh, what is now amounting to a public trial to the Court of Appeals, and I think that's where it belongs. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Anything f you'd like to say in sum as we, before we close down? I, I would like to thank you very much and your commission. I, I have uh, a copy of what I um, said, but we all gave it already, but with the attachment. So uh, it's one copy, it's this ACK report and the letter of this For what you do in general, for the uh, Anti-Human Trafficking Act 2001, I was reading it from internet, I could follow everything. It's, it's a very good, mm -hmm. tremendous job. And I, I even also heard uh, Mr. Obama speaking when there was here the United Nations conference that this is a new form of slavery. And thank you very much for this effort, this emphasize you made on this already for so many years. And hearing us here and that we could bring here the problem we are fighting for for so many years already. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. And I will say um, that if the Dutch government would like to, we will convene a second hearing and okay. invite you to the witness table. Uh, we'll work out a date and I look forward to it. Hearing's adjourned. It would be marvelous. Yeah.